facts. We have a mobile unit on its way to the White House now. As you just reported, the White House doesn't seem to have uh, any more information than the uh, reporters on the scene. And we are also establishing contact with um, our uh, Robert McNeil, who is with the uh, President's <laughs> party in Dallas, and we expect to be getting reports from him very shortly. So as you can imagine, uh, extensive efforts are being made to get our men dispatched to the right place at the right time and uh, get as much information on it as we can. Thank so you, Frank. We shall all stand by then and just relay the information as it comes in. Obviously, it's going to be sketchy for some time because you can imagine what is happening to every circuit, uh, radio and uh, telephone between uh, the East Coast and Dallas, Texas at this moment. Obviously, the circuits are jammed. Uh, the information that we have, this is no time, obviously, for speculation. Facts are all that are warranted. Here is something else. It was impossible to tell at once where Kennedy was hit, but bullet wounds in Governor Conley's chest were plainly visible, indicating the gunfire might possibly have come from an automatic weapon. There is this, Chet. Uh, Representative Albert Thomas, a uh, member of the House of Representatives, said he was informed that President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are both still alive after having been shot in an assassination attempt. This is from Dallas. It is the first word we have uh, that they are, in fact, still alive. It is the first thing definitive that we have. As we say, we can give you only as much as we have. It is that both men were wounded by an assailant or assailants. It's not known who did it or why. And it was also reported from Dallas that it was not determined whether the Secret Service and Dallas police returned the gunfire that hit the president and the Texas governor. There is no word that the assailants have been captured or sighted, uh, probably because the focus of attention now, understandably, is on the president and uh, not so much on those who, who committed this thing. I have some additional information here, Bill, which would indicate that the Secret Service men guarding the president had no chance to uh, return fire. This item says reporters about five car lengths behind the chief executive heard what sounded like three bursts of gunfire. Secret Service agents in a follow-up car quickly unlimbered their automatic rifles. The bubble top of the president's car was down. They drew their pistols, but the damage was done. The president was slumped over in the back seat of the car, face down. Then Governor Conley, after slumping to the left for a moment, lay on the floor of the rear seat. More chat on the quote from uh, Congressman Thomas. He is outside the corridor of the emergency room in which the president and Governor Conley are under treatment. He said he had been told the president was still alive, but, quote, in very critical condition. That from Congressman Albert Thomas, a Texas Democrat, who was in the hospital, Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where President Kennedy and Governor Connolly of Texas have been taken after having been wounded in an apparent assassination attempt. We are expecting momentarily a telephone call. That's why I'm seated near this uh, telephone here from uh, NBC's Robert McNeil, who is with the President's party. It's our understanding that Robert is trying to uh, get to a telephone and get through to us on this special lineup now. Uh, perhaps at that time we'll be able to get uh, more details on what the situation is at the moment and perhaps some of these questions about what happened earlier uh, can be answered for us at that time. In terms, Frank, of, of locating where it happened, uh, a reporter, the AP man, Jack Bell, says the president and Governor Conley were shot as the motorcade entered a triple underpass, which leads to a freeway. They were leaving Dallas. Bell said a man and a woman were scrambling on the upper level of a walkway, which overlooked the underpass. Also significant, the president's bubble top car, the bubble was down at the time this happened. There is nothing yet to indicate that this man and woman were in any way connected with the attack. They have uh, sent out from Parkland Hospital, a call for top surgical specialists in Dallas and also a call for a Roman Catholic priest. But again, the best information we have now is that the president is still alive, but a member of Congress who is outside the emergency room where the president is being treated at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, says he has been told that the president is in very critical condition. You uh, reported, I think, most of this substantially earlier. Uh, here is an AP reporter asked Kenny O'Donnell, the presidential assistant, if Kennedy were dead. O'Donnell gave no answer. Kennedy was taken to Parkland Hospital near the Dallas trademark where he was to have made a speech. Uh, the AP reporter said Kennedy was transferred to an ambulance. He lay on a seat of the car, uh, blood streaming. 
Bell reported three shots were fired as the motorcade entered the triple underpass, which leads to the Stemmons Freeway route to Parkland Hospital. The Secret Service waved the motorcade on at top speed to the hospital. Even at high speed, it took nearly five minutes to get the car to the ambulance entrance of the hospital. Reporters saw the president lying flat on his face in the car. The AP reporter said a man and a woman were scrambling on the upper level of a walkway overlooking the underpass. Larry O'Brien, the presidential aide, says he has no information on the, whether the president is still alive. Mrs. Kennedy was weeping and trying to hold up her husband's head when reporters reached the car. I think it, it might be pointed out in that last report from Dallas, the uh, uh, calling in of surgical specialists and a priest, that this is, uh, this is routine in a, a situation like this. If a Catholic is in critical condition, the summoning of a priest does not necessarily mean that uh, <coughs> the illness or the affliction will be terminal, that death is necessarily near. It is merely a precaution. Again, the, uh, the best word we have is that both President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly are still alive. They are receiving treatment in a hospital emergency room in Dallas, Texas, at the Parkland Hospital, where the two men uh, were taken after being wounded in an assassination attempt today. The report is that the president is in very critical condition. We have no more than that. You can appreciate that we would not have because the prime concern of everyone now is to treat the president and the governor for their wounds and to save their lives if possible. Bill, if I may suggest this, you and Chet have been so busy bringing the uh, bulletin information to the audience. Of course, uh, a great many people are not aware of the earlier details of the story and radio and television sets have been going on all around the country. So I wonder if for their benefit, as well as for mine, I'm getting in on it late, if you could uh, reconstruct what we know from the top in uh, chronological order, insofar as you have those details. Well, basically, Frank, of course, the president was on this two-day trip to Texas, making a series of speeches. Uh, it was said that uh, one of his missions in Texas was to try and coalesce the divergent wings of the Democratic Party. He had made a speech in Fort Worth, Texas, which is, I think, about 25 or 30 miles from Dallas. He then moved to Dallas and was about to make a speech, was on his way to another site of a speech in Dallas or just on the fringes of the city. This was the, a motorcade? It was a motorcade and uh, it was moving with, uh, as has been reported, the bubble top of the presidential car down. Uh, this may have been a tragic uh -huh. mistake. But all we know is that at uh, roughly 12.45 or so, uh, the shots were fired. Central Standard Time. I think it would have been uh, Dallas time. Yes, been, yes, it would have been Dallas time. It has happened within the past... 20 minutes. Yes, within the past 20 minutes or so. Here the president was headed for another speech, and uh, the motorcade was moving along on this freeway, going under a ramp of another freeway when the attack took place. Here is some information on a speech which he apparently had just made before uh, being shot. President Kennedy lashed out today at those he said who confuse rhetoric with reality. Speaking in an area where supporters are booming Senator Barry Goldwater's chances for the 1964 Republican nomination, Kennedy said that ignorance and misinformation, if allowed to prevail in foreign policy, yes, we will. handicaps this country's this is security. McGee, NBC News. Put Mr. McNeil on, please. This is Robin McNeil, our correspondent, who has been traveling Hello, with the Bob. president. Bob, are you there? This is Frank McGee. Bob, I'm in 5HN. We are on the air. You take it from the top, Bob, and tell us everything that you know, if you would, please, in chronological order. Starting at the very top, unless you have some late information on the president's condition. Frank, uh, I'm informed you'll have to repeat that we're not hearing. Uh, Bob, Bob, I'm sorry. We're having some uh, difficulties with our communication here, and apparently your broadcast, the early part of it, did not get on the air. Would you begin again? Yes, go again, please, Bob. They're not getting the, the other uh, end of the conversation, Bob, Frank. I'm sorry. You'll have to I, I tell you what, let's do. Let's do it this way. You speak slowly, and I'll repeat what you say. All right, this is Robert McNeil reporting from Dallas. Now, please go ahead, Bob. Bob is at the hospital in Dallas, where the president has been rushed. The president is seriously wounded. This information comes from Texas Senator Ralph Yarbrough who was with the president.
The shots which wounded the president occurred as the motorcade was running through huge crowds in downtown Dallas. The governor of Texas, John Connolly, was also hit. Uh, the Texas governor was sitting on the far side of the car across from the president. Mrs. Kennedy, who was seated between them, was not wounded. The shots apparently came from a window in a building overlooking the parade route. But about one street back from it, shielded by some trees. Police who immediately fanned out around the area interviewed several witnesses who said who said they saw a man with a gun in the window. Bob informs me that he was in the motorcade. He says he was able to hear the shots, they stopped, and as the shots rang out, people lining the streets screamed and lay down on the sidewalk and in the street. The motorcade immediately speeded up. And rushed the president straight to the Parkland Memorial Hospital from which you're speaking now, Bob. <coughs> And the president was carried in bleeding. Bob, have you any information on how many times or where the president was struck? Bob does not know how many times nor where the president was struck. All he knows is that the president was seriously wounded, and that is the latest information that they have. Think about what you're going to say uh, when you go on says in. he heard three shots. Another reporter at the scene says he heard four. Uh, turning to the Texas governor, Bob, can you tell us how many times or where he may have been? I see, Bob. Now, one further question. Can you tell us anything about yeah. the man who was seen with the gun in the window? Has he been placed under a... Put the phone on there. They say that he was a white man. Put the phone on. Go ahead. Put the phone on. Put the phone on. The there were a lot of Negro people around, but the man seen in the window was a white man. What kind of gun was it, Bob? Was it a rifle? The, a policeman has told Bob that he heard, the policeman heard, that it was a high-powered rifle, but there's been no confirmation of that. Just a moment, Bob. Please stand by. Hold on to Bob. I think we have a gadget here, Frank, that... Put the receiver on that, Frank, and apparently it will function as a speaker. And let Bob talk. Uh, Bob, I'm told that this little thing I've just attached to the telephone... Uh, Bob, could you say a few words for us? You're still there. Is this being uh, broadcast, what, what it's saying there now? That's right. I see. Yep. Bob, I'll tell you what, I realize that you're in a, in a terrible position. You cannot get information as long as you're on the phone, but do you think it would, you would be better advised to remain on the phone or to break the connection and get back in touch with it? Your judgment. We'll be expecting you, and I'll keep the phone uh, and, and be talking okay, with the student. We'll know when you come back. Thank you, Bob, very much. Uh, Frank, uh, to, to interrupt for a moment, there is this from Dallas. Uh, while Robin McNeil is on the phone, of course, he is unable to gather information. President Kennedy has been given blood transfusions at Parkland Hospital in an effort to save his life after he and Governor John Connolly of Texas were shot in an assassination attempt. Uh, the word still is that the president is in very serious condition. Other reports say he is in critical condition. Uh, Governor John Connolly, I think Chet has been moved, has he not? Yes, we have this information which adds up to uh, something rather inconclusive. It says the Secret Service said the president remained in the emergency room 
and the governor was moved to the general operating room of Parkland Hospital. One Secret Service man was overheard telling another that there was no need to move the president because emergency facilities were entirely adequate in the emergency room. Uh, that would indicate uh, just a sort of a snap judgment evaluation that Governor Conley was worse wounded than the president. But as I say, that is only a snap judgment evaluation. Or it, it could mean, Chet, that they are, are separating the two cases so that each can be given full attention. Right. The uh, medical student who is on the line with me says he can see outside a window and that a sizable crowd has gathered outside the hospital. Uh, this telephone line, by the way, is connected to the hospital. Uh, what is the name of the hospital? Parkland. Park, Parkland, Parkland Memorial. Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where the president and the governor have been taken. And NBC's Robert McNeil is getting the latest information now, and should be getting back on the line with us very shortly. Again, to repeat, the president uh, and Governor John Conley have been both shot as they rode in a motorcade through Dallas, and uh, each is in serious condition, to the best of our knowledge. But uh, there is no more definitive word than that. We may get some now. We are going to switch to station WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas, and to newsman Charles yes. Murphy. Well, that's all, yes, that's all right. Just moments ago, authorities in Dallas took a young man into custody. Which was really never held. Is now... As you can appreciate, uh, communication facilities, as you just saw, went in and out. This is a time of what would probably best be described as controlled panic. The arrangements for that switch to Fort Worth were made entirely hastily under conditions of extreme pressure, and that is why the picture came and the audio didn't, and then when the picture dropped, the audio came in. Again, to recap, to the best of our knowledge at this moment, both President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Conley have been wounded by an an assassination attempt in Dallas, Texas. They were moving in a motorcade through a downtown section of the city. NBC's Robert McNeil has reported from the scene, and he was riding in the motorcade, that Mrs. Kennedy was not injured, although she was riding in the car with the president and Governor Conley sitting between them. Each was hit. There are reports that a white man was seen at the window of a building about a block away from the cars. There are other reports that a man was seen with a high-powered rifle. There is no indication yet that whoever fired the shots at the president and the Texas governor has been found. The word from Parkland Memorial Hospital is that President Kennedy is being treated in an emergency room of the hospital, that he has received blood transfusions, that he is in critical condition but alive. There is no word on how many times he was struck by bullets or where he sustained the wounds. Now, we are going to attempt once more to return to station WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas, and newsman Charles Murphy. There is no definite word yet that the, that the person who fired the shots at President Kennedy and Governor Conley in Dallas has been apprehended. We have just received this report, though. Moments ago, authorities took a young man into custody. They took him to the county sheriff's office near the triple overpass near where the shooting occurred. The man was neatly dressed. He's in his early 20s. He is protesting vehemently his innocence, and he says that he has witnesses to prove that he is innocent. Two Roman Catholic priests have been summoned to the emergency room where the president is. A White House spokesman said someone had asked for the priest, but did not say whom. Blood transfusions have been administered to President Kennedy. Governor Conley has been moved to the general operating room. Repeating, just moments ago, authorities have taken a young man into custody in Dallas, but there is no definite word that this is the person who might have fired the shots at President Kennedy and Governor Conley. Charles Murphy reporting from WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas. These uh, additional details from the hospital in Dallas, officials at the hospital say the president has been given a transfusion of B-positive blood. They are calling for fresh blood of that type to have it ready if additional transfusions were needed. Uh, Mrs. Lyndon Johnson, the wife of the vice president, was escorted by Secret Service agents into the emergency room where the president is being treated. Now for Washington reaction to this tragic story, we go to NBC News Washington and David Brinkley. Bill, there isn't a great deal as yet because obviously the news has just got here. It was taken to Congress, which of course recessed immediately to wait to see what has happened. 
We've checked with the White House, which has told us it doesn't know any more than we know, and is fact, in fact has been listening to us to see what, what it could find out. Uh, the president's brother, Edward Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy, was on the floor of the Senate and was informed of the news by the Senate uh, Democratic leader, Mike, Senator Mike Mansfield. Uh, the, only, uh, the only word beyond that we have is that um, Senator Kennedy didn't know at the moment whether he would go to Texas or not. Beyond that, again, there is no particular or unexpected reaction here yet because uh, most of Washington has just found out about it and is shocked and stunned along with everyone else. The White House, again, has no, no more information at the moment than we have. We'll stay here, of course, ready to bring you any at, at, at the moment it arrives. In the meantime, we'll switch back to you, Chet, Frank, Bill. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, this seems tangential and hardly important, but uh, it is reported. The stock exchange closed operations after word of the attempt on President Kennedy's life and the cotton and wool exchange is also closed. I see. Now we are returning to Dallas-Fort Worth to station WBAP-TV and newsman Tom Whalen. Again, uh, experiencing difficulties. We will, however, make the switch when we can. Here, again, is what we know so far. President Kennedy has been wounded in an assassination attempt. He is reported in very serious and critical condition. Uh, he has been given a blood transfusion. He is being treated at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where the attack took place. There are reports in Dallas that a young man has been taken into custody, but there are no indications that he has been charged with anything. He is insisting he had nothing to do with the attempt yes. on the president's yes, life. Yes, Bob. Now, for late details, we go to newsman Tom Whalen at WBAP-TV, Fort Worth. Um, hang on this now. is Tom Whalen in Fort Worth. WBAP newsman James Darnell in Dallas on the scene okay. of the presidential shooting, the shooting in which uh, President Kennedy and Governor Conley were shot, has an eyewitness interview with a Mrs. Jean Hill. Here is the interview. What is your name, ma'am? Jean Hill. I'm from Dallas? That's right. And uh, did you see the shooting, miss? Yes, sir. Can you describe what happened? Yes, sir. Will you do that now? Uh, they were driving along, uh, and we were the only people in this area on our side, and the shots came from directly across the street from us. And just as the president's car became directly even with us, the, we took one look at him, and he was sitting there. He and Jackie were looking at a dog that was in the middle of a seat, and about that time, two shots rang out just as he looked up. This is the president looked up, and these two shots rang out, and he grabbed his chest, and it looked like he was in pain, and he fell over in his seat, and Jackie fell over on him and said, my God, he's been shot. Uh, and there, uh, after that, more shots rang out, and the car sped away. Now, what kind of a car was that? What kind of a car was it? The president... Well, I, mean, I mean, where did the shots come from? The shots came from the hill. From the uh, hill? Yes. Uh, as it was just east of the underpass. Uh-huh. And, uh, we were uh, on the south side. Could you see, could you, did you look up there where the shots came from, ma'am? Yes, sir. Could you see anyone? I thought I saw this man running, but I looked at the president, and, you know, for a while, and I looked up there, and I thought I saw a man running. And so, um, right after that, I guess I didn't have any better sense. I started running up there, too. Uh-huh. And what is your name? Jean Hill. G-E-A-N? J-E-A-N. Uh, and J.A.N., where's your, what's your address, Miss Hill? 9402 Bluff Creek. 9402 Bluff. That was an interview I had with Mrs. Jean Hill of Dallas a few minutes ago. A short time later, Dallas Sheriff's officers took a young man into custody. It's believed that they also took a rifle at the same time, described as a 3030 rifle, which was supposedly found near the scene, although this has not been confirmed. And as we reported earlier, both Governor Conley and uh, President Kennedy are in the emergency room. That is, the president is now. Governor uh, Conley was moved to uh, another room in the hospital. A Catholic priest was called to the emergency room a short time ago, and the president's condition is described as very critical. Representative Albert Thomas of Houston said both men were alive, however. This is Tom Whalen reporting from Fort Worth, Texas, concerning the shooting of President Kennedy and Governor Conley of Texas. Stay tuned to NBC for further details.
Now, Frank McGee has uh, re-established communications with Robert McNeil, who has been traveling with the president. Frank, uh, your report from Rob. Uh, Bob, if you will stand by just a moment until I attach this little uh, device to the earpiece, and then I'll tell you when to go ahead. Please go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, Bob. You can drop the drop the box, Frank. They have it direct. They say. If you can give Bob, go ahead. He's going. He's going, and we're not getting it. So perhaps we'd better go back to the black box. We're not, we're not getting it on a direct feed, Frank. We may have to return to that black box. Bob, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are again experiencing difficulty with the, the uh, feed. So would you start at the top again, please, Bob? And I'll repeat you as I did the last time. Freeway. We were headed for the freeway. That's what I. That's what I. The last rites of the Roman Catholic Church have been administered to President Kennedy, who is said to be seriously wounded in a Dallas hospital after being shot at during a motorcade through the city. The rites were administered a few moments ago by Father Hubert. They do not necessarily mean that the president's condition is fatal. White House officials say the president's condition is still uncertain. He was carried into the hospital unconscious. From the car in which he and Governor John Connolly of Texas were both shot at. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy who is in the rear seat of the open car beside the president was not hurt. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was with the president, walked into the hospital. Bob, let me interrupt. Was he in the same car? All right, please, go ahead. Walked into the hospital, holding his own arm, holding his own arm, uh, just a moment, Bob. I'm going to interrupt for a bulletin that the Associated Press has moved from Dallas. Mrs. Lyndon Johnson said after a visit... Yes, please go ahead then, Bob. Who just emerged from the... from the area where the president has been taken. Said that her husband, the vice president, is fine. She would not say anything about the condition of President Kennedy, however. She appeared to be in a state of shock <coughs> and was hurried away by White House personnel. The hospital is reported to be preparing a blood transfusion for both the President and Governor Connolly. Bob is telling me that the latest he knows at the moment is that the, is that the president's condition is serious and uncertain. That or how many times? We do not know exactly where he was struck nor how many times. But he was carried into the hospital. But he was carried into the hospital. Unconscious and bleeding. Unconscious and bleeding. And last rites of the church have just been administered. And last rites of the church have just been administered. That's all for the moment, Frank. And Bob tells me that's all for the moment. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Uh, if you could make there, the thing arrangement okay. and have there the is, uh, There is this okay. additional detail from the hospital. An assistant to Governor Connolly said he talked to the governor in the hospital operating room. He said the governor was shot just below the shoulder blade in the back. The assistant, okay. Bill Stinson, said he asked the governor how it happened, and he said, I don't know. I guess from the back they got the president, too. These are quotes from Governor John Connolly, who was also wounded. Uh, 
there are additional reports that uh, the governor's aide asked the governor if there was anything he could do, and all the governor said was just take care of Nellie for me. That is Governor Connolly's wife. Uh, she was uninjured. Uh, also, Mrs. Kennedy was not injured. The, uh, as Robert McNeil reported, the last rites of the Roman Catholic yes. Church have yes. been administered to the president, yes. but this in no way indicates that it is expected that he will lose his life. And uh, Chet has something more. Uh, Director, D Director J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI has telephoned the Dallas FBI office ordering an all-out investigation of the attempt today on the lives of the President and Governor John Conley of Texas. Here is an item. Both women, meaning Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Conley, disappeared into the emergency section of Parkland Hospital to await news of their husbands. Outside the emergency room in a buff-walled buff hallway, anxious members of the White House staff gathered, including Major General Chester V. Clifton, military aide to the President, and Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh, the Air Force aide. Uh, Mrs. Evelyn Lincoln, uh, the President's secretary, Pamela Tenure, press secretary to Mrs. Kennedy, and other members of the staff were so shown yes. to a special waiting room not far from the emergency room area where the President uh, was lying. As oh. uh, Frank McGee has reported on direct word from our correspondent, uh, in Dallas, uh, a crowd is gathering outside well, Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Okay. There's also this, Chet, uh, repeating what we got from Fort Worth, that sheriff's officers have taken a young man into custody and are questioning him, but there is no indication that uh, any charges have been placed against him. There is no indication that he is uh, directly involved in this attempt on the life of President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Conley. Uh, Bill, I... I think yes. we have a picture of the President and Mrs. Kennedy as they arrived in Dallas this morning, and I have some fragmentary copy on the first speech which the President delivered in Dallas. This is the uh, picture of the President and Mrs. Kennedy. I think the camera that uh, has they, you, Chet, is the one that would have to get it, the picture. I'll hold it up over here. This is the picture of the first family, or the President and Mrs. Kennedy, rather, arriving in Dallas only a couple of hours before uh, the assassination attempt. Yes, the first speech that the president delivered right. in Dallas, speaking in an area where supporters are booming right. Senator Barry Goldwater's chances for the Republican nomination, the president said that ignorance and misinformation, if allowed to prevail in foreign policy, handicaps the country's security. This was a speech prepared for the Dallas Citizens Council, the Dallas Assembly, and the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest. He did not specifically mention Senator Goldwater by name. The president said, in a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason, or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality and the plausible with the possible will gain the ascendancy with their seemingly swift and simple solutions to every world problem. Chet, there's also this. Uh, in Washington, uh, the two president's brothers, his two brothers, Attorney General Robert Kennedy and his younger brother, Senator Edward Kennedy, are on their way to Andrews Air Force Base. They will fly to Dallas. Uh, additional details from the hospital. Uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson has not been injured in this attack on President Kennedy and Texas Governor Connolly. Uh, the Vice President is somewhere in the same hospital where the President is being treated, Parkland Memorial in Dallas. Uh, it is reported he is badly shocked by the shooting, that doctors are trying to keep him as quiet as possible, and that he is under heavy Secret Service and police protection. It's also noted that throughout the trip in Texas, when uh, the President and the Vice President have been in the same motorcade, they have been kept in separate cars, um, a precaution against just such an attempt as was obviously made today. Chet? I referred a moment ago and read uh, an excerpt from the speech which President Kennedy delivered to a breakfast crowd this morning, earlier. The breakfast crowd of 2,200 people rose in ovation after the speech, and a few minutes later, the president said he felt like he did in France two years ago when he identified himself as the man who accompanied Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. Do you have anything else, Frank? Yes, there was just a, excuse me just a moment, John. Uh, there was just word from the hospital that they had dispatched a call for a neurosurgeon. I understand, would indicate that uh, one of the two had been hit in the head, would it not? Or either the head or possibly some spinal damage. Uh, there is also this, uh, understandably in a situation like this, the information comes in fragments and comes from 
uh, unexpected places and uncontrolled angles. Senator Ralph Yarborough, Texas Democrat, who was uh, in a nearby car when the attack took place on the president, said he saw the president's lips moving at what he called a normal rate of speed while Mr. Kennedy was being rushed to the hospital. How much it means, we do not know. There is further word from the hospital, Bill, that uh, they're trying to make arrangements as quickly as they can for a press conference where as much uh, actual and detailed information as they have can be uh, disseminated. And there is word here, Frank, that at least one neurosurgeon has arrived at the hospital. I should imagine in a case such as this that uh, virtually every medical specialist of any sort and description and capability would be called into the hospital so that all uh, medical treatment would be available to the president. Chet? In just this momentary lull, I would assume that the memory of every person listening at this moment has flashed back to that day in April 1945 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt... Excuse me, Chad. Here is a flash from the Associated Press, Dateline Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead of bullet wounds. There is no further confirmation, but this is what we have on a flash basis from the Associated Press. Two priests in Dallas who were with President Kennedy say he is dead of bullet wounds. There is no further confirmation. This is the only word we have indicating that the president may, in fact, have lost his life. It has just moved on the Associated Press wires from Dallas. The two priests were called to the hospital to administer the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church, and it is from them we get the word that the president has died, that the bullet wounds inflicted on him as he rode in a motorcade through downtown Dallas have been fatal. We would remind you there is no official confirmation of this from any source as yet. Bill, just moments before you brought the flag, I had word from the hospital that the vice president, Lyndon Johnson, and his wife had just left the hospital, then rushed away into a motorcade and departed. This, Frank, might might be confirmation yes, of the flash. We must stand by for confirmation, as Bill has yes. uh, emphasized. This is rather sketchy information. We will stand by. We should have. Now, uh, there apparently is word that this AP flash, this report from the two priests, that the president has died of bullet wounds is confirmed. We will attempt now to get to station WBAP-TV in Fort Worth, Dallas for confirmation. We go to newsman Tom Murphy. Substantiating this but not confirming it is a report about five minutes ago by the Dallas Police Department to all of its officers that the president had died. Some three Five minutes later, the AP flashed that two priests at the hospital say the president is dead. Charles Murphy, returning now to NBC in New York. Word uh, from two sources. Again, it is not... All right. We have uh, NBC's Bob McNeil on the line now with a report. Please go ahead, Bob. White House Press Secretary, Malcolm Kilduff has just announced that President Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. After being shot at... After being shot... By an unknown assailant... By an unknown assailant... During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. The president died... The president died... Approximately 25 minutes... Approximately 25 minutes... After the attack took place... After the attack took place... He had been rushed, bleeding and unconscious... He had been rushed, bleeding and unconscious... To the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas... To the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas... And was given blood transfusions... And was given blood transfusions... About 15 minutes ago... About 15 minutes ago, reports NBC's Bob McNeil from Dallas, to whom I'm talking now. A priest emerged... A priest emerged... After having given the president... After having given the president... The last rites. The last rites. Just before the announcement of the president's death was made... Just before the announcement of the president's death was made... Vice President Lyndon Johnson... Vice President Lyndon Johnson... Uh, emerged grim-faced... Emerged grim-faced... And was driven off with a police escort... And was driven away with a police escort... To assume... To assume... The constitutional responsibilities... The constitutional responsibilities... Of the presidency... Of the presidency... 
A casket. A casket. Has just been brought into the emergency ward. Has just been brought into the emergency ward. Of this hospital. Of this hospital. For President Kennedy. For President Kennedy. The attack took place. The attack took place. Uh, as the president was just completing. As the president was just completing. What amounted to. What amounted to. A triumphal drive. A triumphal drive. Through downtown Dallas. Through downtown Dallas. Encountering the biggest. Encountering the largest. And in some ways the most friendly crowd. And in some ways the most friendly crowds. Of his two-day Texas tour. Of his two-day Texas tour. Dallas police. Dallas police. Had put into effect. Had put into effect. The most stringent security precautions in the city's history. The most stringent security precautions in the city's history. Because they had anticipated. Because they had anticipated. There might be some demonstrations. There might be some demonstrations. Against President Kennedy. Against President Kennedy. Like those which uh, marked the visit. Similar to those which marked the visit of UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. Of UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson on October 24th. On October 24th. Um, Mrs. Kennedy. Mrs. Kennedy. Who was sitting beside the president? Who was sitting beside the president? In the open car. In the open car. Was not hurt. Was not hurt. However, the governor of Texas. However, the governor of Texas. Uh, John Connolly. John Connolly. Who was also in the car. Who was also in the car. Was wounded, reportedly in the chest. Was wounded, reportedly in the chest. And a more blood. A big a repeat, Bob. F further supplies of blood. Further supplies of blood. For transfusions for the governor. For transfusions for the governor. Have just been brought into the hospital. Have just been brought into the hospital. Um, the shooting came. The shooting came. According to witnesses. According to witnesses. From the second floor. From the second floor. Of a building called the Texas School Book Depository called the Texas School Book Depository. Which is about 100 yards. Which is about 100 yards. From the tree-lined parkway. From the tree-lined parkway. On which the president was driving when the shooting occurred. On which the president was driving when the shooting occurred. Uh, three shots were heard. Three shots were heard. Frank, that's about all I can tell you at the moment. Bob, thank you very much. We'll keep the line open. OK, we'll keep the line open. That was a report from NBC's Robert McNeil at the hospital in Dallas, Texas, confirming <coughs> by uh, way of word from the White House press secretary that President Kennedy is dead. The death, uh, according to Malcolm Kilduff, who was acting as the president's secretary on this trip, came roughly 39 minutes ago at about okay. 1 o'clock Dallas time. Uh, there is uh, further word that Vice President Lyndon Johnson was taken from the hospital and he was not wounded. He has been taken from the hospital off to a secluded place. Uh, he will assume the constitutional duties, succeeding now the late John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the former president, uh, the late president of the United States. Now, uh, it is necessary, even at a time when an event is yes, so Bob. fresh upon us, to look forward. We yes. will do that now as we go to NBC News, You're on Washington, TV, Bob. and David yes. Brinkley. I'm relaying. Right, I'm relaying your word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole situation is, of course, that the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, will be given the oath of office as President of the United States as soon as it can be done. Um, I haven't had time to check this, but I believe the oath can be administered by anyone who can, uh, a Justice of the Peace, or anyone who can administer an oath. Had it happened in less unfortunate circumstances uh, he normally would be sworn in by the chief justice of the supreme court but in this case he will be sworn in by by anyone who has the power to do it that means therefore that lyndon johnson will be president of the u.s and will finish out the the uh, mr kennedy's term running until january of 1964. what happens then obviously we don't know the next in line for the presidency then, after Mr. Johnson, becomes John McCormick of Massachusetts, Representative John McCormick of Massachusetts, who is the Speaker of, <clears throat> the, Speaker of the House. He is, uh, as I say, next in line. We were told a few minutes ago the Air Force had four jet airplanes on the ramp at nearby Andrews Air Force Base, ready to take off for Texas, and perhaps by this moment they have. I don't know presumably to bring Mr. Johnson and other members of the party back here and or to take some of the members of Mr. Kennedy's family to Texas. 
Um, I assume, though we don't, we have no other details as yet, but I assume that uh, Mr. Johnson will return to Washington immediately and will take over the late President Kennedy's duties. Now, that is about all of the detail we have at the moment. As I reported earlier, Senator Edward Kennedy, the president's brother, was presiding over the Senate in Lyndon Johnson's absence. The vice president, when he leaves his job in the Senate, can turn the gavel over to anyone, any member. In this case, Senator Edward Kennedy was presiding when the word came of the shooting. At that time, it was not known whether the president was dead or alive. A reporter in the press gallery upstairs overlooking the Senate gave the word to a Senate page who then went down and told senators on the floor, the leadership, and the Senate was adjourned immediately and then was called back into session for a prayer by the Senate chaplain, the Reverend Frederick Brown Harris. In the meantime, uh, the members left the floor and gathered around uh, the news tickers and waited to see what has happened, and by now they know. Again, uh, the few sketchy details we have at the moment, the White House was, uh, w was not getting information very rapidly because of the confusion and the haste at the scene. So what we have learned, we have learned from Texas, not from here. Here is a late report. Cabinet members, members of Mr. Kennedy's cabinet, that is Secretary of State Dean Rusk, the Secretary of Interior, uh, Stuart Udall, and uh, others, but I'm relying on memory. I don't remember who else was there. We're on their way to Japan as a part of a mission to discuss trade with the Japanese and other matters. They were one hour out of Hawaii. They have turned back to the United States. We don't know yet if they're coming to Washington or Dallas, but I would assume Washington. There isn't much they could do in Dallas. Pierre Salinger is with them. Uh, the Kennedy children's Bob Goralski, who is at the White House, NBC's reporter there, says the Kennedy children are still there and it's a normal school day for them, for Caroline and her classmates. It, we are now told that the president was shot once in the head. Governor Connolly of Texas was hit both in the head and the wrist, we are told. The police have found a rifle of some foreign make. We don't know... Uh, we don't know what make, nor do we know exactly who had it, but we are told again, as we've reported earlier, that a young man was picked up at the scene and is being questioned. We don't know who he is. That is, uh, well, that's all we have at the moment. Vice President, Lind uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson will now be sworn in as President of the United States and will serve out the remainder of Mr. Kennedy's term, which runs until January 20th, I believe, 1964. A little more, about a, little, about a year and a half from now. Beyond that, we don't know. Chet, Frank, Bill, you there? Any more? Do you have any more from Texas or elsewhere? Yes, David, just this. President Kennedy was assassinated today in a burst of gunfire in downtown Dallas, Texas. Texas Governor John Conley was shot down with him. The president, cradled in his wife's arms, was rushed in the, his blood-spattered limousine to Parkland Hospital and taken to an emergency room. An urgent call went out for nurses and uh, for blood. The president was 44 years old. He was shot once in the head, as David has just reported. Governor Conley was hit in the head and the wrist. Police have found a foreign make rifle. The president was conscious as he arrived at the hospital. Father Huber from Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church was called and administered the last rites of the church. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, who now becomes president of the United States, was in a car behind the Kennedys and the Connollys. He is to be sworn into office as soon as possible. He rushed to the hospital and then was whisked away again by Secret Service men. His whereabouts, certainly, and as we can understand, is being kept secret. Yes. Kennedy lived about an hour after a sniper cut him down as his limousine left downtown Dallas. Automatically, of course, the mantle of the presidency falls now to Lyndon B. Johnson, a native Texan who had been riding two cars behind the chief executive. Here's one other little bit of information. The priests came out of the ward at approximately 1.37 p.m. Central Standard Time. The announcement by the two priests brought audible sobs from a crowd of scores of newsmen and other citizens crowded around the emergency ward entrance of the hospital. Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas, talking only a few minutes before to the newsmen, collapsed in sobs as he told of witnessing the slaying of the president. Yarborough said he was in the third car behind the president it seemed to 
him, he said that at least two of the shots came from the right rear. He said he couldn't say anything about the third shot. So that is the story. The president of the United States is dead. The new president is President Lyndon Johnson. The memories of, I suppose, all of us are flashing back to that warm April spring day of 1945 when we lost the wartime president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. For many of us, this is the second time around that we have been through one of these crises. The last shooting incident, not uh, fatal, involving a president occurred in 1950 when President Harry S. Truman was in office and was living in Blair House in Washington. The High White House was being renovated at that time. You may recall that two Puerto Rican nationalists tried to gun their way into Blair House and assassinate President Truman, who was taking a nap at the time on the second floor. So that is the story. The President of the United States is dead. The new President of the United States is Lyndon Johnson. Mrs. Kennedy, we understand, is still at the hospital. She was not hurt. The White House spokesmen have refused to comment on her condition. President Johnson is under heavy guard and was whisked away from the hospital by White House officials. President Kennedy, we are now informed, was shot in the right temple. It was a simple matter of a bullet right through the head, said Dr. George Berkeley, the White House medical officer. Frank? Chet, we, uh, we have more details once again reestablishing contact with our station in Fort Worth, Dallas. And so, for additional information, we go to station WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas, and newsman Charles Murphy. The car wanted in connection with the assassination of President Kennedy has been stopped in Fort Worth. Police report that the suspect in the They're shooting calling. is in custody. Further word will come later. Fort Worth is 30 miles west of Dallas. Just a few minutes before this report, we heard from one of our newsmen in Dallas on the scene, James Kerr, who said that a Dallas policeman, J.D. Tippett, was shot to death by an unknown man in a car minutes after the president and Governor Connolly were shot. The officer was shot about two miles from the scene of the presidential assassination. Repeating the first of this bulletin, the car wanted in connection with the assassination of President Kennedy has been stopped in Fort Worth. At an intersection, police reported that they had the suspect in the shooting on the ground. We hope further confirmation will come on this momentarily. This is Charles Murphy reporting from WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas. Now, we have ready for you uh, an eyewitness account of the assassination of President Kennedy. This was recorded, and the voice you will hear is that of an NBC sound man traveling with one of our television camera crews in the presidential trip to Texas. The sound is the voice of John Hofen. Yes, Bob. This is John Hosen of the NBC White House News Crew traveling with the President in Dallas, Texas. We had just driven through the downtown section of Dallas through the business area where we had where the President had received a very tumultuous welcome. We were approaching a drive which would put us on a freeway where we would then drive to the trademark where the President was to attend a luncheon and make a speech by the Dallas citizens. As we had turned down this moderate curve here, the there was a loud shot. At first we thought it was a cherry bomb by some teenager. Then it was immediately followed by two and three more. Everybody sort of ducked. Then there were people falling to the ground. We did not know who was shot. Ladies and men both were screaming. David Wigman, the cameraman in the car in which I was riding, immediately jumped out, was making pictures. We did not know who was hurt. When the president's car took off with the police escort and the secret service and a mad dash, which turned out to be towards the hospital. Uh, we picked up one of the remaining Secret Service men who had been left behind. He went with us in a mad frenzy in this motorcade behind the president's car. We were cleared through the police lines and finally got to the hospital. As we came down the final drive there behind the emergency entrance, we were told that we could not go any further and we stayed outside and were kept informed by Malcolm Kilduff, the associate news secretary on the president's staff, of what was happening. As I left the hospital to come over here to this phone, which is approximately a block away, he whispered in my ear, he says, John, we understand the president has died. Since waiting here on the phone, they have made a that he has died.
That was the recorded voice of John Hofen, an NBC sound man who was traveling with a television film unit in the presidential motorcade and who witnessed the assassination of President Kennedy. Now, Frank McGee, who has been keeping an open telephone line to the Parkland Memorial yes, Hospital in uh, Dallas, where President Kennedy died, is once again in touch with the NBC correspondent Don't who was away, traveling Bob. with the president, no, 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 Robert no, no, McNeil. Uh, here now, Frank and his communications with McNeil. Yes, Bob, I understand that they're clearing the room, so would you give us a report on what you can see from there now? Well, President Kennedy's body, Frank... President Kennedy's body... ...is in the emergency section. Oh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Bob, I understand you can be heard directly now, so go right, uh, right ahead with a straight report. President Kennedy's body is in the emergency section of this hospital at the end of a long corridor. Uh, for the past 45 minutes, the corridor has been filled with bewildered-looking White House officials, hospital interns, reporters... Now police are clearing out the entire corridor, and we believe that the president's body is about to be brought out. A bronze uh, coffin was taken in about 15 minutes ago, and a few minutes, and that was shortly after White House Press Secretary Malcolm Kildoff had officially announced that the president died at uh, 1 o'clock Dallas time, that is 2 o'clock New York time, after the shooting incident in downtown Dallas. Bob, thank you very much. Does this mean you will have to leave this uh, telephone? Uh, I can hold on for a second here, Frank, I think. Well, please do. I'll hold on as long as I can. Yes, as long as you can. And that's that's the word from Dallas, Bill, at this thank time. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Merrill Muller, I think you have some additional detail here. The flag at the White House has just been lowered to half-mast. We also have two eyewitness reports on the wire services. One eyewitness reporter, a television reporter named Mal Couch, said that he saw a gun emerging from the window of a warehouse. This warehouse was located just beyond a triple underpass through which the presidential motorcade had to go on its way into downtown Dallas. And just as the car emerged from the, the presidential car emerged from this underpass, three shots rang out. Three, not two. We know that Mr. Kennedy was hit in the right temple and that Governor Connolly was hit in the head and wrist. That's all we know at the moment on Governor Connolly. We do not have a late report on his condition. As you know, the president died just about an hour ago from his wounds. This is the first assassination of a president of the United States since William McKinley, I think. In 19 That's right. Well, here's uh, uh, something on Governor Connolly. He's reported in satisfactory condition. This is just in, as Bill just told you, Governor Connolly is in satisfactory condition. We have no report on the condition of Mrs. Kennedy. She is in the hospital still. Traveling behind a police escort with his wife, Lady Bird Johnson. She is now the, the first lady of the land since Mr. Johnson has become president of the United States. Lady Bird Johnson has been uh, under heavy guard and is in seclusion somewhere in downtown Dallas. Actually, uh, Merrill, uh, excuse me, ahead, do you Frank. have information? This is not no, information. Sir. Well, I was just going to say that President Kennedy is the, is the third American president to be assassinated since Lincoln. Uh, the others were James Garfield in 1881 and William McKinley in 1901. And as a matter of fact, this continues one of, um, I suppose you'd have to call it one of the grimmest statistics in American history. No president in the last 100 years who has taken office in the zero year has, um, has completed his term of office. They've all died. The, uh, the capital is, is now starting to react to, to what has happened in Dallas, and for a report on that, we go now to Martin Negronsky, NBC News in Washington. This is the flag at half-mast outside our studios here at NBC in Washington. We assume that the flag at the White House is at half-mast in the same way, and that all over this capital city of the United States, Wherever the American flag flies, it has been lowered to half-mast to, as a sign of respect to the President of the United States. We have very little news as yet on the reaction in Washington. It happened so suddenly. There has been very little opportunity for any real reaction. Senator Mansfield has made no statement, the Senate Majority Leader. Speaker McCormick, who is now in the position in relation to President Lyndon Johnson, that Lyndon Johnson was in relation to President Kennedy, has made no statement, nor has the Senate Minority Leader, Mr. Dirksen, nor, as far as we know, has the Senate 
whip Mr. Humphrey, Senator Humphrey of Minnesota. Senator Humphrey was informed by his aide while he was at lunch at the Chilean embassy of what happened. His aide reported that the senator's voice cracked several times, that he seemed completely numb, that he was un unable to make a response, and said he would be immediately back to his office. I am told by an aide of Senator Ted Kennedy, of Senator Edward Kennedy, who now is presumably en route to Dallas with his attorney general brother, Robert that when Senator Kennedy was informed of this, that he said not a word, merely laid down the gavel where he was presiding over the Senate of the United States, quietly stepped down from the rostrum and proceeded to leave the chamber. And the Senate, of course, went into immediate adjournment after the prayer by the Senate chaplain, Mr. Brown. All through the city, as we try to call government offices, there is it's almost impossible to reach prominent officials. I tried myself to call the Attorney General's office and discovered that the Attorney General had been out at his home in Virginia having lunch. The girl who answered the telephone in his office was crying so heavily she couldn't really make herself understood to me and I can only make out that she knew that the Attorney General was at lunch and that he had been informed of what had happened. It's a state of shock, really, is the only way that I can describe the feeling that we have here in Washington. It goes for me, it goes for David Brinkley, for all of his correspondents as well. It's so impossible, I think, for all of us to contemplate, to realize, to understand that this young, so vital man can be dead in this fashion. There's nothing else, really, to report from here in the Capitol. Back to New York. I think we must uh, we must remember that it was only last week when uh, when the president was making a similar motor drive from New York's Idlewild Airport into New York, uh, when uh, at his discretion he elected not to um, follow behind the usual um, motorcycle escort with all the flashing lights and the sirens because it is so disruptive of traffic and at the time that he was coming into New York it was a particularly busy time and uh, it of course created some snarls the president's uh, limousine was delayed at several points at one time it was even blocked by a truck and some buses but they did of course make it into the heart of New York and later the president was uh, pictured as having enjoyed this um, uh, quite enormously because uh, he liked to be treated uh, uh, w with, without those considerations and uh, yes, Bob, I am. Do you have word? Uh huh. Frank is speaking to NBC correspondent Robert McNeil. They've been in constant telephonic communication since uh, the story first broke. Uh, Robert has been working at the hospital, and of course, you can appreciate that there are times when he will be off gathering information, other times when he will come back to the phone to report to us. Um, and so, from time to time, Frank and he will confer as to whether or not he has new information that he can add to what we already know about uh, what happened in Bob, Dallas today. Bob, if you'll today. stand by just a moment. Um, Bill, unless you have some late information. I have not, sir. No, All go right, right ahead. Uh, Bob was just talking with me about the contrast and attitudes of the president's arrival and the mood that now prevails in Dallas, and I think this might be of some interest. So, Bob, uh, if you'll go ahead. I believe he can be heard on the air I now. I think he enough. can, yes, Frank. Yes, Bob, go ahead. Extraordinary the uh, the contrast was when the president and Mrs. Kennedy arrived at the airport. There was a crowd of many hundreds, and Mrs. Kennedy, uh, following the uh, the practice she's developed the last couple of days, took the initiative in going over to the fence. And she and the president walked all along the fence, shaking hands with both hands, and the crowd was really delirious with them. And this kind of uh, reaction was something like the reaction that was encountered in the big crowds all the way through the town. Very friendly. I saw only one hostile sign all the way through the, uh, the, the motorcade, which went about 10 miles. And then suddenly, in the middle of this bright sunshine, the friendly crowd, and uh, nobody expecting anything, these three muffled shots were heard. And it, it couldn't have been a more startling, uh, gruesome contrast to the very pleasant, sunny, friendly atmosphere that he'd received, despite all the warnings that things were going to be difficult for him here in Dallas. Why was that, Bob? Because of Adlai Stevenson's recent visit? Well, and... um, this, this had been the, uh, the thing that uh, made the police worry. And uh, Dallas got such a bad name around the world after the attack on Stevenson that the authorities were determined that uh, there would be uh, no repetition of this. You remember the ambassador was 
Uh, he, they, someone spat on him, and someone hit him over the head with a, with a poster. Um, they mobilized a third of their entire city police force with extra paddy wagons around the corner and everything else, and uh, to make and put on a strong propaganda campaign in the newspapers and on the radio and TV stations to make sure that the name of Dallas was not uh, dragged in the mud again by any unfavorable incident when the president came. And uh, that is why it was it was such a contrast. What is the uh, situation in the room where you are at the hospital now? Uh, well, I'm in a little uh, small uh, waiting room where emergency patients wait to be taken into the uh, into the operating room where they're treated. And uh, there are a few policemen who are the only ones left in the long corridor leading to the room with double swinging doors behind which we assume the president's body is being placed in the bronze coffin, which was taken in about half an hour ago. And... Uh, from which we expect it to come out shortly. Bob, we have a still photograph here in the studio that has just moved, and it shows um, a man and a woman and what looks like two small children lying on the ground. I understand you saw these people. Yes, and... well, uh, they were the first people I went to. I must have got there shortly uh, after, before that picture was taken, when I jumped out of the press bus, and they, in common with many other people, were screaming and lying down in the grass to escape from the shooting. The minute the shooting sound started, there were, the air was filled with uh, the screams of women and children, a sort of very feminine wailing filled the air, and everybody lay down on the, on the sidewalks, on the grass, on the edge of the parkway, and I assume that the picture you're talking about is that, because and nobody else I know was besides Kennedy and Governor Connolly. We lost a part of that. You say, as far as you know, no as one else As far as I know, no one else was hit other than President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob, again, about the uh, area or the building from which the shot apparently was fired, could yes. you describe that for us and tell us about how far away it was from the car and how they would have been able to see the car from that distance? Yes, well, I'll describe the, uh, the scene. There was, as you come out of the main street of downtown Dallas, which was packed with people, it leads into a parkway called the Triple Underpass. And that parkway, which is lined with trees and lawns, takes a bend. And behind some trees in the sort of service road is a brick building of about eight stories, which is called the Texas School Book Depository. I now, see. So there were... to witnesses, two of them who I talked to and the police talked to, say they saw a man with a gun uh, in the, one said the second floor, another one said the fourth floor, a window of that building. Now, from either floor, Frank, he would be able to see over the low trees to about a hundred yards away where the president's car was. An unobstructed view, Bob? I would think so. I did not, I was not able to go up to either of those windows, uh, so I couldn't see for myself, but looking at it from the ground, it looked as though it would be. Mm -hmm. um, the president, therefore, must have had, uh, presented either a profile to the assailant, if he was, in fact, in those windows where the witnesses say, and, or, his three-quarter back, because his car had actually passed the direct line from the window. Uh, you see, the, the way it went is the car would have approached the window head on, then turned left and gone down a slight uh, decline under the um, under the underpass. Just a moment, Frank. Yes, Bob. Uh, that seems to fit, Bill, with what he said. The word that we had here was the president was struck in the Frank right temple. Yes, Bob. Body just been carried out. Go ahead and say again, Bob. The president's body has just been carried out of the hospital in the bronze casket, and it was accompanied by his military aide, Major General Clifton. And, uh, and it has been placed in an ambulance. I understand it is being taken straight to the uh, air base where he landed for it to be flown back to Washington. I see, Bob. The crowds have all been moved away from the door by the local police and the Secret Service. I can hear the motorcycle escort outside with the ambulance starting up. And the president's body with the police motorcycle escort is now pulling away from the hospital. It is about one and a half hours since he was shot. The president has been dead for about an hour and seven minutes. Vice President John, Lyndon Johnson, who is now constitutionally his president, left immediately after the president's death was confirmed and with a peace escort went off to the airport, presumably to go straight to Washington to assume the constitutional responsibilities of the president. 
Bob, returning to your earlier narrative, you had just taken us to the point where the president's car had turned, and I was about to ask... Now there were three cars behind him with Secret Service and several Texas congressmen, and then I was in the first press bus, the front of the first press bus, which came behind those. And just as we turned the corner, about uh, 40 feet behind the president's car, um, I heard three shots. Now, Bob, was the president seated or standing at that time? The president was seated because there were very few people at that point. It was a thin crowd at that exact point. Most of the crowd had been concentrated a few hundred yards back. The president was seated. Mrs. Kennedy was seated. But when I heard shots, I saw people fall to the ground and was not looking for the moment at the president. The car immediately disappeared under the underpass and speeded up to go straight to the hospital. And I left the press bus and went to this building from which shots reportedly came. Mm -hmm. what, so, sort, what sort of a building is it, Bob? Well, it is a... Uh, I told you the title. It's the Texas uh, School Book Depository. It's a uh, uh, orangey brick building of about eight floors. And... Um, it was showing an expanse to the street of maybe uh, about eight windows wide in the front. Well, Bob, from the point where they think the man with the gun might have been seen yeah. to where the president was actually felled, would it have been possible for him to have been struck by a bullet in the right temple? That's his Well, um, I believe that if he was using a high-powered rifle with a telescopic sight, uh, one policeman told me he understood it was a high-powered rifle. I don't know about the telescopic sight. I assume that from that distance, it could be. I see. It about, could be. About how fast was the president's motorcade going at the uh, time of the fire? Slowly. Firing? It was about, by that time, having just gone around the corner, it was probably between 15 and 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And Vice President Lyndon Johnson was how far behind? Uh, I'm not sure, Frank, I which see. car. There was a jumble of congressmen in the car immediately behind, and I'm not sure which car Vice President Johnson was in. And then you say, of course, that the motorcade speeded up immediately and rushed and, toward and the hospital. And disappeared under the underpass, and I had jumped out by that time and was running with the police. They thought the assailant had fled over some railroad tracks, and they chased him through uh, what they thought was the assailant through several trains. Mm -hmm. uh, standing on the tracks, and I went with them, and therefore didn't see the president immediately uh, as he went under the underpass. Well, did they apprehend this person they were no, chasing? No, uh, they apprehended nobody at that time. They went back and started talking to witnesses on the scene. I see. Just now, a moment, Frank. Yes, Bob. Which car was uh, there is also this that could be added. We have. Uh, Frank, I'm told that Johnson, the Vice President Johnson, was in the car directly behind the president. I see. Now, Bob. From the point where the assassination occurred to the hospital is about how far in time and distance, would you well, say? Well, it's uh, about a mile and a, and a half. I was able to commandeer a private Excuse car. Me, Frank. Hold it, hold it, Bob. We have a little Frank, information here, are, please. We are now going to the United Nations, where I'm told delegates from the member nations are expressing their condolences to Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. So we switch now to the United Nations. I call now on the Secretary General. Mr. President. As Secretary General of the United Nations, um, uh, I would like yeah, to express just, uh, hang on profound on. sorrow at this most tragic event and to be associated in the condolences to Mrs. Kennedy, to the members of the bereaved family, and to the government and people of the United States. Royal I request members of the General Assembly to rise and observe one minute of silence in tribute to the memory of President Kennedy, after which I shall adjourn this meeting in sign of mourning.
the meeting is adjourned. Delegates of the 111 member nations of the United Nations standing in a moment of silence in sympathy to the United States government for the loss it has sustained today with the death, the assassination in Dallas, Texas of President John F. Kennedy. We have word that uh, Mrs. Kennedy, who was riding in the car with her husband and Texas Governor John Connolly at the time the shots were fired, that Mrs. Kennedy at no time collapsed, at no time did she give way to hysteria, that she fell to the floor of the car where the president had slumped after the bullet struck him in the head and cradled his head in her lap, held him in her arms all the way to the hospital and at no time gave way to hysteria, uh, although there were reports of her shouting, oh no, at the time the president was hit by the uh, sniper's bullet. We now have more reports from the area where it happened, so we return to station WBAP-TV in Fort Worth and newsman Tom Whalen. Here's an additional report on what you heard NBC correspondent Bob Abernathy describe a few minutes ago, the building in which the sniper had hidden. It's the Texas School Depository at the intersection of Elm and Houston Street in Dallas. Dallas Crime Laboratory Lieutenant J.C. Day went to the building a short time after the uh, shooting took place, and he walked out with a British 303 rifle. The rifle has a telescopic sight. Now, the rifle was found on the sixth floor of the building near a corner window. Also, police searching that area found three empty 303 cartridge cases, also scraps of chicken, as if a person could have been there for some time. There were boxes of books, textbooks, and other school materials stacked up all around on three sides of a sniper's nest, as if he had been there for some time. There was a gun rest made of papers near the open window that commanded the site from uh, which the sniper, uh, from, by which the presidential motorcade passed when the president and Governor Connolly was shot. We also have another eyewitness account, uh, Charles Bren of Dallas, who was probably the last man to view the president from the street as the motorcade sped away. Here is Charles Bren's report. Hello. Jimmy? Where's your witness? Hey, Bren. You were a witness to the incident here. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the president when it happened. You no, know, it's exactly what you thought, sir. <laughs> he was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Commerce Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved in the mid... That's all right, sir. You wet. <laughs> As he, as he was waving back, he was, he was, the shot rang out and he slumped down in the seat. And his wife reached up toward him and uh, he, uh, he, he was slumping down and the second shot went off and just knocked him down from, from the seat. The two shots, two shots. Did you see the man who did the... No, sir, I did not see the man who did it. I, I, all I, all I did was look in the man's face when he was shot there and saw that expression on his face and grabbed himself and slide. And the second one, whenever it went, why... I'm positive it had hit him. I hope it didn't, but I'm positive it had hit him, and, it, and he went all the way down in the car. Then they speeded up, and I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him and hoped that there wasn't a maniac around. I'm sorry. I can't help you more, but I, I'm a little freaking. Yes. Thank you very much. As we said before, the sniper's nest has been found and police have recovered a British 303 rifle with a telescopic sight. This is Tom Whalen reporting from Texas for NBC from WBAP-TV. Things can move this fast when you are dealing with a story of this magnitude, even while we were getting reports from Fort Worth, Dallas, on finding the sniper's nest and details of uh, what was going on in that building from which the bullets were fired. Uh, we were handed another story here from Dallas, and Frank has that. Well, it's to the effect that a Secret Service agent and a Dallas policeman have been shot and killed some distance away from the area where President Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, no other information was immediately available. Now, there was an earlier report, Frank, uh, from WBAP-TV that a Dallas policeman had been shot to death approximately two miles 
from the scene where uh, the assassination on, uh, of President Kennedy took place. This uh, seems to be the same policeman, but that a Secret could Service well agent was killed in addition. Uh, also, in the earlier reports, we were told that a car that was wanted in connection with the assassination of President Kennedy had been stopped in Fort Worth and that a suspect had been picked up. Now, we have heard, had no further word on that, no indication whether the police have or feel they have captured the person or persons who took part in this successful attempt on the life of President Kennedy. As NBC's Bob McNeil reported just a few moments ago, the president's body has been taken away from the hospital where he died after being assassinated, and um, it is the, the uh, assumption that it is being taken to the airport where he had arrived just a short time earlier for his um, motorcade and, and planned speech in Dallas. The assumption is, and a great deal of, um, of what we're doing now is, is assumption, the assumption is that uh, he will be taken by plane back to Washington where his body will lie in state. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy, at last report, was still in the hospital. Um, who is now President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, left the hospital a short time earlier. And uh, the thought there also was that he was headed for the airport to catch a jet back to Washington where he will be sworn in as President of the United States. Uh, there is this, Frank. Uh, Robert Garowski reports from the White House that George Reedy, who is Lyndon Johnson's assistant, has just arrived at the White House. And the speculation is that that is in preparation for the administering of the presidential oath to Mr. Johnson. This, uh, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, go ahead. Frank. I was just going to say that it always occurs as soon after uh, the death of a president as possible. There is no, um, there is no particular protocol or formality for it. And as far as we know, the president, uh, the vice president, is contacted and informed of the passing of the president if he does not already know and is almost immediately sworn in. Sometimes there is a private swearing in ceremony that is, um, that is repeated later, uh, but uh, it is not a joyous occasion, as you can imagine, and uh, constitutionally, the vice president becomes president immediately upon the death of the president of the United States. So Lyndon Johnson is now president of the United States and will presumably be sworn in sometime this afternoon. There are reports, Frank, that the president's father and mother, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Kennedy, were informed of the attack on their son uh, at Hyannisport, Massachusetts, but there is no indication that uh, we have yet that they know uh, that they have, in fact, lost their son. There was an indication that when they were told he had been wounded that the, his mother, Mrs. Rose Kennedy, was getting ready to fly to Dallas. Presumably, those plans may change. Uh, also, uh, Governor John Connolly of Texas, who was riding in the car with the late president and was wounded, uh, it is reported that he is not out of the woods, but that uh, his vital signs are good. He has been operated on for a gunshot wound in the chest. Uh, doctors said that uh, the governor of Texas has a good pulse and his respiration is satisfactory, although he is in much pain. Europe, as we might expect, has been deeply stunned, shocked, and no doubt amazed by what happened in Dallas today. Uh, our servicemen overseas got word of it on the Armed Forces Network. In the Vatican, Pope Paul VI was immediately informed. Uh, Francis Cardinal Spellman of New York, who was in Rome for the Ecumenical Council, uh, was also told of what had happened to the president. He said, I am saying the rosary for him now. Uh, Cardinal Spellman said the president's death was a great loss to the country and to the world. In Great Britain, radio and television suspended their regular programming after the flash of the president's death was received there. It came uh, in London at about 7.30 in the evening, uh, British time. And uh, the Soviet news agency TASS carried a flash on its circuit uh, this afternoon saying, and I quote from TASS, it has been officially announced that the United States President John F. Kennedy has died in hospital after an attempt was made on his life again, and still quoting Toss, by persons as believed from among the extreme right-wing elements. Close quote on Toss. Frank? Well, it's just a, a note here, Bill, that it was at 2.05 p.m. I suppose that would be Central Eastern. Standard Time. It was Eastern Time. No, it would, it would have been Central That's Time right, yes. uh, when, uh, when the president's body was removed from the hospital. Uh, it was driven away in a lengthy cream-colored ambulance, and the curtains, the side curtains, were um, were tightly drawn. There is something here, Frank, on at least one of the persons, and there may have been two, there may be only one, picked up in connection with the assassination of President Kennedy. A white man in his mid-twenties was arrested in the Riverside section of Fort Worth uh, in the shooting of a Dallas policeman. The man with black curly hair wore a red shirt, denied that he was connected with the assassination of the president, 
he was in handcuffs when he was seen by reporters. So a man has been taken into custody. It is in connection with the shooting of a Dallas City policeman. There is no word yet whether this is or is thought to be the man or person who today assassinated President Kennedy, apparently with a single shot from a high-powered rifle <coughs> fired from the fifth floor of a building which was, as we are told by Robert McNeil, roughly 100 yards from the president's motorcade, uh, which was traveling at uh, slow speed. Now, we are starting to get conflicting reports on weapons. Uh, there was one uh, that it was a 303 rifle, and the three spent 303 cartridges were found on the fifth floor of this building, uh, along with some remnants of chicken, indicating that the sniper staked himself out for quite a while before firing the fatal shot today. Now there is uh, another word that a Mauser has been found, uh, 7.65 Mauser. It's a German army rifle which had a telescopic sight with one shell left in the chamber. Three spent shells were found nearby. Uh, what this means, whether this is the weapon or the other, we do not know. Possibly the Mauser is measured in millimeters and might come close to being a 303, Frank. Might well be. I would, I would expect certainly that during these early and confusing moments of this thing we're likely to get uh, conflicting reports. Uh, it's of no consequence in the final analysis. The president is dead, has been shot. I'm sure that all of us from time to time have wondered if it is really necessary to go to the great lengths that um, the Secret Service does go to in trying to protect the life of the president of the United States. Each infinite detail is checked out. I would, um, I would assume, but I think it's a safe assumption, that the driver of the automobile who was a Secret Service man knew instantly where the nearest hospital in Dallas was located. And uh, the reports we have received from there uh, say that he sped away immediately and went directly to the hospital in an effort to uh, spare the president first from further gunfire and uh, secondly, of course, to get him to the hospital as quickly as possible. But despite uh, the inconvenience and the annoyance that is connected with uh, the Secret Service effort to protect the life of the president of the United States, it still comes as a tremendous shock to us to realize that, uh, that a thing like this can happen in our country and with the precautions that are that are made. One of those who was a witness to the assassination today and was a member of the presidential party was Texas Senator Ralph Yarbrough, and he went to the hospital uh, when the president was taken there and was the first to give newsmen anxiously awaiting in corridors outside some indication of what the president's condition might be. This is a picture, I think, if we can get it here on our frame of, of the Texas senator uh, at the hospital. Uh, as he came out and, uh, and tried to talk with the newsmen. Everyone was shocked and broken up, and he quite obviously is under some stress and strain, um, appears to be in tears. Texas Senator Ralph Yarbrough. Frank, in speaking of uh, precautions taken in, in presidential motorcades, the security, the attempts to uh, protect him from any possible attack, uh, I have ridden in those motorcades, and you have too, and I'm sure you realize that total protection is just completely impossible. As they realize this, uh, they, well, if one stops and thinks, here you have a distance of maybe 15 or 20 miles, and uh, the person that you're trying to protect is in an open automobile. Uh, quite frequently, he is standing and waving. Uh, the distance from his arrival point to his destination, as I say, could be 15 miles. You can have... Uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands, and on occasion millions of people uh, lining these streets. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of buildings on either side uh, where an, an assassin could attempt to conceal himself. So in a very real sense, it is an impossible, impossible. it is an impossible thing to, um, to give um, complete and total protection to the President of the United States. Wasn't even attempted, as a matter of fact, prior to the assassination of uh, Abraham Lincoln. We had no Secret Service. We have further reaction, Frank, from overseas on the loss of President Kennedy. West Germany's Chancellor Ludwig Erhardt said the news fills the German people with deep grief. Uh, again from Rome, Cardinal McIntyre of Los Angeles, Cardinal Ritter of St. Louis, called together the student priests of Rome's North America College to recite prayers for the late president. Cardinal McIntyre said Cardinal Ritter and myself were having dinner when we heard the news, the astounding news of President Kennedy's death. And Cardinal McIntyre said, we are shocked, grief-stricken, and our hearts are pained. The Italian premier-designate Aldo Moro said, uh, speaking of President Kennedy, his stature as a politician in his great country and on the international scene was growing in the years of courageous policy of renewal. French Prime Minister Pompidou said, it is atrocious, it is frightful, I am overwhelmed. As is the city where President Kennedy fulfilled his duties, the city of Washington, D.C. So for further developments there, we switch now to David Brinkley in Washington.
The flag has been lowered at the White House. The White House, the acting White House press secretary, Malcolm Kildolf, he is acting in the absence of Pierre Salinger, who is in a jet plane out over the Pacific. He, along with four members of the president's cabinet, was on his way to Japan for a meeting. When the news reached them about a half hour ago, the plane turned around and headed back toward Hawaii and then back toward Washington. Kilduff said the president's body would be flown to Washington this afternoon. Senator Kennedy, Senator Edward Kennedy, the president's brother, and Mrs. Sergeant Shriver, his sister, that's Eunice Kennedy, arrived at the White House a few minutes ago. From there, they took a helicopter to Andrews Air Force Base, which is a few miles outside of town. From there, they will take a jet plane to fly to Dallas to join Mrs. Kennedy. The Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, was at home in Virginia having lunch when the news came. He lives a mile or so outside the city limits. He came back into town and is leaving or has left his uh, for the airport also to fly to Texas. The government has been closed down. Congress has adjourned. The uh, four members of the cabinet, as I say, who were over the Pacific have turned back. Some of the comments from members of the Senate betray the same shock and horror expressed by everyone else on hearing the news. For example, uh, Mike Mansfield, the Democratic leader of the Senate, when the news came to him, said he was a man who contributed so much and deserved so much more in return. Senator Bible of Nevada said it's one of the great tragedies of our lifetime and the world has lost a great champion in the United States, a courageous president. And Senator Byrd of Virginia said he was deeply shocked. It's a disaster and he could not find words to express his distress. There are similar sentiments expressed by everyone who has said anything at all. The Secret Service, which normally is stationed, the Secret Service, which is charged with protecting the president, physically protecting him, is a plainclothes civilian arm of the United States Treasury, which is just next door to the White House, to the left of the picture you're seeing. They are the husky, muscular young men you see in the news pictures. When the president's motorcade is moving at slow speed in a street or a parade, they usually walk along or run along beside it. They usually, uh, they are aware that it is impossible. You see a crowd is gathering across the street. That's Lafayette Park facing the front entrance to the White House. A crowd has gathered over there for no particular reason because there is nothing anybody can do. But crowds usually do gather there in moments of crisis. That is, of course, the White House flag at half staff lowered as soon as the news came. The Secret Service tries to guard him as best it can, very often by uh, keeping their own bodies in line of any uh, weapon that may be aimed at the president. But obviously, they can't cover every window or every tree or every manhole, and they rely primarily on the decency and the good sense of the American people. That, again, is NBC's live television camera on the White House lawn looking through the iron picket, iron picket fence across Pennsylvania Avenue to Lafayette Park, named for the Marquis de Lafayette, whose statue is, uh, is there, and people are beginning to gather there. These are the grounds of the White House, the West Executive Wing, where the President's office is, and where a few minutes ago, George Reedy, who is a close associate of Lyndon Johnson, arrived. Didn't say anything, but we assume he came to help make arrangements for the changeover of administration. We don't know specifically yet that Lyndon Johnson has been sworn in, has officially taken the oath, but whether, it, whether or not he has, he soon will. And whether or not he has, he's president anyway, because that's, what the con that's how the Constitution spells it out. He, uh, he will, of course, serve out the remainder of Mr. Kennedy's term until January of 64. Beyond that, we don't know. That's, that is about all the detail we have here at the moment, Frank. So we'll switch back to New York for any further details you may have from Dallas or elsewhere. I say only this, David, that we are still in touch with Dallas and uh, as we are with you there in Washington. And um, very shortly, of course, the, the emphasis of one part of the story will shift from Dallas back to Washington. It is being anticipated that the president's body is being flown back to the nation's capital, uh, perhaps even now. And um, that is where we expect President Johnson to um, 
officially be sworn in. We are anxious, of course, for further information on the uh, quest for the assassin. We do not know whether the actual assassin has been placed under arrest yet or not. We've had stories that one, perhaps two persons have been placed under arrest in Texas, and we have had stories within the past half hour that a Secret Service man as well as a Dallas policeman were killed in a shooting incident sometime after the president had been assassinated. Uh, the assumption here would be that the, the two shootings are connected, but it's not necessarily true. So in, in very short order, the story will shift uh, to Washington for the formalities there. There and, is. Uh, we'll remain in Dallas for the search for the assassins there, and we will keep our team standing by in both areas to bring you the developments as soon as we have them. That's the point I was trying to make. Yes, right, Frank. There is, there is this, too, detail on Mrs. Kennedy following the assassination of her, pre her husband, the president. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy and the president's body were escorted from the emergency entrance of Parkland uh, Memorial Hospital in Dallas by two motorcycle officers. It is said that Mrs. Kennedy walked out the back door of the emergency entrance as the president's body was being taken out. She walked slowly. She looked around her in what is described as a dazed manner and appeared to be in a state of shock. Those who saw her enter the hospital an hour and a half earlier said she had not been hysterical, that in spite of the tremendous experience she had undergone and was undergoing, she had managed to control herself uh, and keep her head. Uh, there is this ironic note, the main body of the reporters who daily cover the president apparently did not know that he had lost his life until they got to the destination which the motorcade was headed for, the trademark where the president had been scheduled to make a speech this afternoon. As Robert McNeil has pointed out, he was in the first press bus riding behind the president, and that was three cars behind the president's car. But the main body of the White House reporters was at the rear of the motorcade. They were riding in two buses, and there were many of them who did not know of the shooting until they got to the downtown trademark in Dallas, and there they found out their first hard news of what had happened, although they did have some idea of what was going on when they saw the motorcade start to fall apart and Dallas police and Secret Service men start to take off in all directions. We are told now that President's, President Kennedy's body will arrive at Andrews Air Force Base at 5.30 this afternoon, Washington time. It's about uh, no. a little less than two hours from now, Bill. Just about two hours, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, Reaction from overseas. The first point we are able to call in right now, uh, our correspondent in Rome, Irving R. Levine. Shock and grief are the reactions in Italy where President Kennedy was enormously popular. Italian President Segni immediately sent an aide to the American embassy to express his sympathy. President Segni called President Kennedy's death a great loss to humanity. Pope Paul is preparing a radiogram which is expected to be ready within an hour. Italian radio and television made the announcement of the president's death and then went off the air except for solemn music. Cardinal Spellman and other American bishops in Rome for the Ecumenical Council expressed shock. Cardinal Spellman said that he is saying rosary for President Kennedy now. Irving R. Levine, NBC News, Rome. There is the first overseas point we have called in to bring you a reaction to the assassination of President Kennedy, which took place in Dallas, Texas, this afternoon. Frank McGee is uh, in Bob, touch with Robert McNeil, let me a White House you, correspondent uh, you're who was traveling me. with the president at the time the assassination took place. Um, yes, here's Mom. Frank's conversation with McNeil. I just wanted to interrupt you to tell you that you are going on the air. You are, in fact, on the air now, so why don't you make the report direct, Bob? Go right ahead. Uh, um, we can have pictures, here, Frank, in about uh, 15 minutes. I see, Bob. Um, the doctors who attended President Kennedy have just reported his condition. <clears throat> Doctor... The moment I've lost my notes here. Doctor... All right, Bob. Uh, yes, the chief attending surgeon at the hospital, Dr. Malcolm Perry, said the president was in critical condition from wounds in the neck and the head when he was brought into the hospital. Neck and head. Neck and head. He said it is possible that these were both caused by the same bullet. I see. I'll just to tell you what the doctor said. Please. He said they immediately attempted resuscitation. Um, the pre 
professor of neurosurgery at the hospital, Dr. Clark, was called in, and several other doctors. They arrived, but the president's condition at that time did not allow any sign of resusc uh, resuscitation. He was critically ill and moribund, that is, near death. Mm -hmm. They attempted uh, respiration. They gave him oxygen, anesthetic. They uh, performed a tracheotomy, that is, making an opening into the neck to assist breathing. They gave him blood and slipped and also chest in the tube to uh, remove any possibility of air getting into the uh, pleural space. They attached an electric, electric cardiograph to monitor his heartbeat, but uh, shortly after that, he, uh, his heart failed, and none of the, they tried external massage to um, rec uh, produce a heart movement again. This was without any success. They did achieve for a brief moment, a faint pulse, but the president finally died at 1 o'clock, about 25 minutes after he was brought into the hospital. Um, they said that the brain wound in the president's head involved a, a great loss of blood and a great loss of brain tissue. The wound was in, brain wound was in the back of his head, slightly to the right which, Frank, would fit with the picture I gave you earlier... Yes, Bob. ...of the president being, um, having his back to the assailant. If this uh, hypothesis that the assailant was in the building I described is true, but this conflicts with the fact that the wound in the neck, the doctors say, was in the front of the neck, just below the Adam's apple. Now, it could have been that there were two bullets. One struck him as he faced the assailant, the other as the car turned the corner or perhaps one bullet just struck him from the front in the neck and then went up his brain. There's in any no... case, the president never regained consciousness. The, the, the president was unconscious from the moment he was struck he until was, he died. He unconscious and near death from that moment. I see, Bob. And now, um, we understood, you told us earlier that the president's body had been removed from the hospital. It was a speculation at that time that it was being taken to the um, yes. airfield. Yes. Are you able to confirm that it has gone I to the... I believe that, that that is true, that it, it's reported that it has gone to the airfield for, for, uh, to be flown back to Washington. And but that... uh, Lyndon Johnson, the new president, is for the moment remaining here in Dallas. Do you know where he is at the moment? I do not know at the moment where he is. But he has not. He is not on his way back to Washington. No, he is not. Not as yet. Yeah. Bob, thank you very much, and stand by. We'll be getting in touch with you a moment later. That's it, Bill. Thank you, Frank and Bob. Um, there is this news from Dallas. The police department has arrested one man, but in connection with the slaying of a Dallas policeman, it is not yet known whether this man who is under arrest has any connection with the assassination of President Kennedy. Further details now from the scene. We go to station WBAP-TV in Dallas-Fort Worth and newsman Charles Murphy. Late film has just arrived in our newsroom from Dallas. This unedited film shows the scene at the crowded Dallas trademark when news of the shooting was announced. Also on the film is a prayer given then for President Kennedy.
would each come with perhaps the most earnest prayer that we ever offered in behalf of our president, our governor, the members of their families. So we pray that even in this gathering, that we may reveal that calmness that shall be pleasing to thee, and that we shall await word in a spirit of prayer. In thy holy name, amen. There you have the scene at the Trade Center in Dallas where President Kennedy was going to make an address and the crowd assembled waiting to hear the president learning what had happened to him. If we can, we will try to clear up this arrest which has taken place in Dallas. The police department has arrested a man, but in connection with the shooting of a Dallas policeman, the fatal shooting of a Dallas policeman, the man was arrested in a theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas uh, he had a pistol at the time he was arrested, and the policeman he allegedly killed was killed by a pistol shot. There is nothing now to definitely link this man who has been taken into custody with the assassination of President Kennedy, who uh, was killed by a bullet from a high-powered rifle, from all we can tell from uh, reports from Robert McNeil at the hospital, uh, from doctors who... Uh, treated the president and uh, were able to give specific and clinical details of the wound, uh, indicating that it was uh, a high-powered bullet and quite probably a large caliber bullet, too. We uh, are now going to go to an NBC mobile unit, which is outside the NBC building here in New York, uh, for pictures and sounds of the reaction of citizens of this city to the loss of their president. We go to NBC reporter Jeff Pond. We're on the street outside the NBC studios in Rockefeller Center. Sir, how did you hear of the president's assassination? Gentleman came into an office in which I was transacting business and uh, mentioned it to us. And at the time, I really wasn't able to believe it. I had to hear it for myself. And unfortunately, I did very shortly afterwards. What is your feeling now? I'm terribly shocked and saddened by it, and I would add angered by it. Why angered? I think it was a horrible, senseless thing, and I hope that the rest of the country feels the same way. Do you think that this assassination somehow reflects a climate of opinion in the country now? I hope that it doesn't reflect a climate of opinion that is very prevalent in the country today. It certainly obviously reflects a, an opinion that some people hold. I hope that as an American and the other people as Americans do not generally hold this uh, feeling. You said some people. Who do you mean by that? I don't feel expert enough to express an opinion, but the only evidence that I have as to who these people are are these ultra-conservative groups that have been uh, distributing literature and spreading hate in Texas and who attacked uh, Ambassador Stevenson short was about a week ago. A little longer than that. Of course, yes. no one knows if these people are no. indeed responsible. No, certainly not. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, what was your reaction? I was very shocked and saddened uh, by the president's death. I was getting some eyeglasses fitted when I first heard about it, and then I was riding on the bus when they finally told me he was dead. Do you find it difficult to believe even now? I really do. I really find it difficult to believe now. The president was in Dallas, which is, of course, part of the South. Do you think that somehow uh, his racial policies are in any way connected with this? That's the first thing I thought of when I heard about it, yes. I thought that uh, probably some segregationist crackpot or something, just they had it all planned out, and I, I really believe that his blood will be on their hands forever, yes. Thank you. How about you, sir? Do you believe it even now? Uh, this is the first time in my life I'm... I honestly say I'm not proud to be an American. Uh, I, right now I'm serving in the armed forces and I'm just home on leave. And it's an understatement to say it was a shock. 
I uh, at first did not believe it, and I have trouble believing it now. Uh, I just don't think it, it reflects the uh, thinking of most people. Uh, as was stated before, I, it's, I think it's a small minority, and it's just an unfortunate day for the United States that this can happen. It's just something you do read in history books and just ne never want to believe that can happen when you're living. Do you think this in some way reflects on the security arrangements that the uh, Secret Service... There are random samplings, what I've called man-in-the-street interviews, of people here in New York City, their reactions to the loss of uh, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, who died approximately an hour and 45 minutes ago in Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, after being fatally wounded by a sniper. Developments in the nation's capital, reported now by NBC's David Brinkley in Washington. Bill, we are, again, we've reported this before, but we will report again that the president's body is expected to arrive at Andrews Air Force Base, a few miles, it's an air, a few miles outside of Washington, at about 5.30 Washington time, which is about an hour and 40 minutes from now. The church bells all over town are ringing. We're told that people are standing on street corners, crying openly and freely. NBC's Robert Abernathy reports from Andrews' base that the base commander says the president's body, again, will be arriving at 5.30. He also says that Senator Edward Kennedy and his sister, Mrs. Shriver, who was Eunice Kennedy, have just taken off by jet for Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts. Uh, we assume, then, they are going to their home state to join their mother, father, and other members of the Kennedy family. We also are told that military officers who have the job of arranging state funerals are at the White House now and uh, presumably making the plans. Mr. Kennedy is the first president to die in office since the Defense Department was set up and these uh, arrangements were made. And I think, I think there, is no, uh, there is no set standard ritual to be followed, so to some extent it will have to be made up. Presumably, the Army will be in charge of the arrangements, as it always has been, and it has, of course, caissons and ceremonial horses at Fort Myer, Virginia, which is nearby, along with honor guards of troops who presumably will be used. That is about all we have here at the moment. Uh, Richard Valeriani of NBC News is at the White House, as is our mobile unit with a live picture, so we'll switch there and see what's happening. Richard? The American flag atop the White House here in Washington has been lowered to half-mast. It came down shortly afterward. There was confirmation of the president's death in Dallas. In the White House itself, the president's two children are still there, Caroline and John Jr. We do not know yet if they have been informed of their father's death. We don't know either if there are any of the cabinet members here right now. The two ranking members of the presidential staff were Ted Sorensen and McGeorge Bundy, two of the president's aides. The picture of the flag flying at half-mast, as seen through the trees stripped of their leaves, captures the mood of grimness here at the White House. Outside in front of the White House, crowds have begun to gather, waiting for they probably don't know quite what, perhaps looking for some visual confirmation of what they and everybody else find so hard to believe that the president is indeed dead, the victim of an assassin's bullet in Dallas. Police have roped off one side of, the, of Pennsylvania Avenue. They are allowing pedestrians to walk in front of the White House, but not to congregate there. Extra police details have been sent and have to contain the crowds outside the White House and to surround the White House on all sides. Traffic is moving normally and there are no other changes. We are also told that an assistant to Vice President Lyndon Johnson has also arrived at the White House, Mr. George Reedy. There is not a great deal of hard information coming from the White House press office. The first word that was received there was from a reporter who was asking for permission to enter. First word of the, the fact that the president was shot. The mood in there, too, is one of just utter shock, utter disbelief. The Press House, the uh, White House press office is jammed with reporters waiting for some bits of information, waiting for any kind of, of word on what is going to happen next. 
To repeat, most of the news from here is, er, from here is being received from Dallas. There is no late information on what the next developments will be. The crowds are still gathering outside in the front of the White House, across Pennsylvania Avenue. The weather in Washington is gray, rather unseasonably warm, slight chill in the air. People here, as people must be all over the country, walking around with looks of stunned disbelief on their faces. This is Richard Valeriani, NBC News, at the White House in Washington. Here in Washington, Senator Goldwater of Arizona, Barry Goldwater, who was the man regarded, or was the man regarded, as most likely to oppose President Kennedy in an effort to take the presidency away from him in the election next year, has issued a statement in which he says that it is most shocking and dreadful that a thing like this could happen in a free country. The president's death, Senator Goldwater said, is a profound loss to the nation and to the free world. He and I were personal friends. It is also a great loss to me. Mrs. Goldwater and I offer our heartfelt sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and to the president's family. He has canceled the political appearance he was going to make last night in Grand Rapids, going to make tomorrow night in Grand Rapids. He reflects really the feeling that is prevalent here on both sides of the aisle in Congress, the feeling of great personal bereavement, the feeling of loss, a feeling of shock. I think back to a, the night of the convention in 1960 when Vice President Lyndon Johnson accepted the nomination. Governor John Connolly was then the floor manager for Lyndon Johnson and was the man who was always his closest assistant in all of his political campaigns. That is Governor Connolly of Texas who now lies wounded in a hospital in Dallas. About two o'clock in the morning when there was much talk that Lyndon Johnson would be offered the vice presidential nomination. John Connolly told me that he was positive he would never accept it. I had talked earlier to the late speaker, to Sam Rayburn. He told me, too, that Lyndon Johnson would never accept the vice presidency, would never give up the job of Senate Majority Leader to take it. And I bet John Connolly then $50 that Lyndon Johnson would take the vice presidential nomination. And at 2 o'clock that morning, John Connolly made that bet with me, really positive that his very close friend, Lyndon Johnson, would not accept it. This, I suppose, is the way that history is made. Had Lyndon Johnson not accepted it, he, of course, would not be president of the United States today. No one could ever have believed or dreamed that a president so young would not conclude his term of office, that death would interrupt him. There is very little else to report here in Washington, just the general reactions from... Oh, and a bulletin has just come in from Dallas. A sniper armed with a high-powered rifle murdered President Kennedy today, according to the Associated Press Dispatch. Oh, here barely two hours after Kennedy's death, Lyndon Johnson has taken the oath of office as the 37th President of the United States. So it is President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Fifty five years old, the new president of the United States. Now back to New York. Here are details on the swearing in of Lyndon B. Johnson as president of the United States. The oath was administered in Dallas at 1.38 Central Standard Time. That would be roughly an hour and 20 minutes ago by a federal district judge, Sarah T. Hughes. Uh, president Johnson took the oath aboard the presidential plane at Love Field in Dallas as he prepared to fly to Washington to take over the presidency. Uh, this is the oath that was administered to Mr. Johnson. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will do the best of my ability to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. That is all we know about the swearing in of Lyndon Johnson as the 36th President of the United States. Mr. Kennedy's predecessor, General Eisenhower, has issued this statement here in New York on the assassination of the president. 
Quote, I share the sense of shock and dismay that all Americans feel at the despicable act that resulted in the death of our nation's president. Mrs. Eisenhower and I also join with all other citizens in expressing our personal grief and prayerful concern to Mrs. Kennedy and all other members of the family. The statement issued on behalf of General Eisenhower here in New York this afternoon. Frank? Bill, the uh, Moscow radio is playing funeral music after announcing the death of President Kennedy, and um, all diplomats in the Russian capital are described as being aghast. And uh, the United States ambassador to Russia, Foyde Kohler, was told of the news, and his response was to say it's terrible, terrible. The Moscow radio quoted reports, and this is Moscow radio now, um, assuming that extreme right-wing elements were believed responsible for the assassination. News of the president's death by a bullet in the head was immediately passed on to the top Soviet figures, this according to Russian sources. No reaction directly from the Kremlin was expected until tomorrow. And Russian television broke into its late-night programming to uh, announce the assassination, and the Soviet news agency TASS reported from New York here that, quote, an attempt was made on his life by persons believed to be among extreme right-wing elements. Of course, later they were informed that the president was dead. It's a heart-clutching thought to think of those two children in the White House, uh, the son and the young daughter. And uh, we can only assume, of course, that they have been informed of their, of their father's death. Um, regardless of what one may have felt about the uh, Kennedys as a political institution in the United States, they were regarded by all as being terribly vivacious and vital people who were quite, quite alive. And the situation at the moment is that the President John F. Kennedy is dead. His body is believed to be uh, en route, or shortly will be en route, back to Washington. It's expected to arrive from Dallas at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington about 5.30 Eastern Standard Time today, which is about an hour and a half from now. The new president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, has been sworn in by a federal judge in Dallas and is remaining for the moment in Dallas. The president's brother, the senator, Ted Kennedy, and um, a sister, the wife of Sergeant Shriver, are on their way to Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts. The family, of course, comes from Boston, and it is assumed that they are going there to be with the parents of the president. The last word we had on Mrs. Kennedy was that she was at the hospital where the president died. Um, she probably is not at the hospital now, but we do not know where she is. Her privacy is being respected as well it should be under these circumstances. Mrs. Johnson is no doubt with um, the new President Johnson. And um, that is the situation that we have it at the moment. And do you have some more information, Bill? Uh, only, Frank, that uh, there was word that Mrs. Kennedy had, in fact, left the hospital I see. With, uh, with the body of the President, mm -hmm. presumably to go uh, to Dallas's Love Field, uh, from which place the body would be uh, flown back to Washington for uh, the state funeral, which will follow. And preparations for that, we understand, are already being tentatively made by military experts who would handle the affair. They are gathered at the White House. Did we want to go to this I believe here? so, Frank, yes. Right. We have prepared some material on some of the last appearances that President Kennedy was able to make. In what has proved to be his last formal speech, the late President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, commented to a dinner in Houston, Texas last night. Excuse and, me, uh, Frank. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Frank. That's, I'm told, not ready. All right. We'll, so handed it and we'll have it for you in a moment, then. Uh, if I can, I will attempt a, a chronology of what happened today. The president was in Dallas on a five-city, two-day sweep of the state. He had his wife with him, uh, her first act of campaigning, and it supposedly was to uh, look forward to what she would be doing next year in his expected presidential campaign. Uh, the president had made at least one speech in Dallas and was on his way to a trade center to make another when a sniper's bullet hit him in the head. Uh, it took five minutes for the motorcade to dissolve sufficiently so that the president could be driven to the hospital he was driven to the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. Uh, when he was brought in, doctors said that uh, his condition was moribund, that is, close to death, that he was unconscious. The wound, from the descriptions they have given, was massive, and uh, apparently nothing that medical science could do could make any change in his condition. He died in approximately a half hour from the time he sustained the wound. The first word that came of the president's passing came from two Roman Catholic priests who had been summoned to the hospital to administer to him the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church. 
Riding in the car with the president, in addition to his wife, was Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife. Neither of the ladies was injured, although Governor Connolly did sustain, we are told, three wounds, one in the chest, one in the wrist, and an extremely minor one in the leg. He has undergone surgery, apparently for removal of the bullet which struck him in the chest. He is uh, said to be in reasonably good condition, but there is uh, the qualification left uh, that he is not yet out of the woods. That is roughly what we know of what happened today in yes, Dallas. Right. There is no indication that the sniper or snipers has been found. One person has been taken into custody three, in the city four, of Dallas, nine. but that is in connection with the killing of a Dallas policeman. Uh, policemen and Secret Service agents who fanned out from the area where the attack on the president took place on a freeway uh, have found a rifle, and now for a late report from Fort Worth, Dallas, we go to station WBAP-TV and newsman Charles Murphy. That is roughly what we know of what happened today in yes, Dallas. There is no indication that the sniper or snipers has been found. One person has been taken no, into custody three, in the city of Dallas, nine. but that is in connection with the killing of a Dallas policeman. Uh, policemen and Secret Service agents who fanned out from the area where the attack on the president took place on a freeway uh, have found a rifle. And now for a late report from Fort Worth, Dallas, we go to station WBAP-TV and newsman Charles Murphy. Here now are late, unedited, unscreened films of the shooting scene in Dallas. This was a scene near the Stimmons Expressway. In front, no, this is in front of City Hall in downtown Dallas, a mile east of the shooting scene. Heavy crowds line the downtown streets to view the presidential party. As in all of the Texas stops, there were many teenagers attracted there by the First Lady and the President. This is Main Street in Dallas. Is this moving west? This is moving west toward the fatal moment. The motorcade is traveling at about 20 to 25 miles an hour, slowly westward down Main Street in the heart of Dallas. The time, about 12.20. During the noon hour, heavy crowds from downtown offices lining the route. That looks like the school depository building on the right. I'm not sure. This, this is the scene of confusion. Something has happened here. The cameraman running toward the scene to the presidential car ahead of him. We caught just a blurred glance of the old school depository building from which the sniper fired the shot. This is the reaction from the crowd. All is confusion at the scene. Here a woman shelters herself. Now racing toward the hospital. On Stimmons Freeway, past the trademark to the right where the president was to have spoken, where he was to have criticized the fanatical right. There, a picture. That is Parkland Hospital. A mile and a half to two miles from the shooting scene. Parkman Hospital, where the president died in Dallas. By the time these films were shot, of course, the presidential car was already at the hospital. This is Major General Clifton, the military aide of the president, press secretary going into the hospital. These pictures. This is, this is General Clifton. This is the emergency room entrance of Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Later films, as they are developed, and as they arrive here, will be shown. This is Charles Murphy reporting from WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas. As Murphy pointed out to you there, that was unscreened, which means he saw it for the very first time as you saw it. 
unedited films of uh, what happened, or some of what happened in the motorcade. If I might explain to you that blurry and, and confusing scene, obviously what happened. When the shots were fired, the cameraman who was riding in one of the cars behind the president very wisely kept his camera running even as he <laughs> jumped from the car and ran towards the president's car and then over towards the people who uh, were shielding themselves, ducking down, trying to avoid uh, what was going on. It was the only way the cameraman could have gotten you uh, a picture of what went on. Uh, he very wisely took no time to try to wind the spring on the camera or anything else. Just keep it rolling, get as much picture as possible, and get as close as possible to the scene of action. That is what the cameraman did. That is why it looked uh, somewhat unorthodox in terms of what you are used to seeing. And that is why it's such a precious piece of film, because the cameraman thought. Frank? Well, just this, that uh, former President Hoover has issued the following statement. Uh, Mr. Hoover says, I am shocked and grieved to learn of President Kennedy's assassination. He loved America and has given his life for his country. I join our beloved nation in heartfelt sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and their two children. A few moments ago, we were trying to bring you film that was made of the president's last formal speech, and I understand now that this is ready to go. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, in what has proved to be his last formal speech, the late President John Fitzgerald Kennedy's comments to a dinner in Houston, Texas, only last night, concerned themselves, paradoxically, with the glowing and progressive future. The president arrived in Houston to be greeted by large crowds of enthusiastic supporters. In fact, it was with a view to building up voter support in Texas that uh, Mr. Kennedy made his two-day so-called non-political tour. The late president had carried the state by narrow margins in 1960 with what has been conceded to be the important support of Mr. Lyndon Johnson, at that time the vice presidential candidate. Mrs. Kennedy also made the trip in what was her first public appearance since the tragic birth and death of their third child, Patrick. Mr. Kennedy was in Houston to take part at the testimonial dinner for Representative Albert Thomas, one of the most influential members of Congress. Thomas is considered to have been instrumental in gaining for the Houston area the substantial United States investment in the man to the moon program. Throughout his Texas tour, the late president was accompanied by Governor John Connolly, a friend and a political ally of uh, Mr. Lyndon Johnson. Political commentators have argued that Mr. Kennedy's visit was also designed to smooth over the rift in Texas politics, a rift which had been widened by last year's gubernatorial contest between Don Yarbrough, a liberal Democrat, and Governor Connolly, who won. Uh, Connolly was allied with the more conservative elements of the Democratic Party. The late president is understood to have sought a compromise between the warring factions in order to achieve a unified effort to carry Texas for the Democrats in 1964. All of these maneuverings, of course, have been made futile, struck down by the shot which has been fired from an assassin's gun today. Lyndon Johnson is now president of the United States. Governor Connolly is now in the Dallas hospital, reportedly in serious condition, a result of a bullet in the lung. In his remarks before the Houston audience last night, Mr. Kennedy spoke about the place that Texas and the United States will take in the space efforts of the next decade. The late president referred specifically to the important firing of the Saturn booster, which is scheduled to take place next month. And he also referred to the Race to the Moon, a project which had occupied an important place in his presidential program. The subject is of special interest to Texans, not only because of the Manned Spacecraft Center at Houston, but also because of the continued interest in space and allied subjects, which Mr. Johnson has for many years championed. It fell to Lyndon Johnson to praise Congressman Thomas, and in doing so, the new president recalled an anecdote which might well have been applied to himself. This in Houston, and we are to hear, first, I believe, the vice president. Congressman Thomas. Mrs. Thomas, Mr. President, Ms. Kennedy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Some years ago, someone asked Speaker Rayburn why it happened that the Texas delegation in Congress had such an uncommon influence upon the course of national affairs. Mr. Rayburn's reply was characteristically pointed and quite brief. He said, we pick them honest, we pick them young, we send them there, and we keep them there. 
Then President Kennedy spoke, referred to Thomas as one of the most remarkable members of Congress. In what was to be his last major essence, the president said... Next month, when the United States of America fires the largest booster in the history of the world into space for the first time, giving us the lead, fires the largest payroll, payload into space, giving us the lead. It will be the largest payroll, too. <laughs> Who should know that better than Houston? In 1990, your sons, daughters, grandsons, and grandchildren will be applying to the colleges of this state in a number three times what they do today. Our airports will serve five times as many passenger miles. We will need housing for 100 million more people and many times more doctors and engineers and technicians than we are presently producing. That is why we're trying to do more in these areas. As in the 30s, Albert Thomas and Franklin Roosevelt and others did those things which make it possible for not only Texas, but the entire United States to prosper and grow as we do in the 1960s. In 1990, the age of space will be entering its second phase. And our hopes in it to preserve the peace, to make sure that in this great new sea, as on Earth, the United States is second to none. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy in Houston, Texas last night, vibrant and alive, looking forward to the future, now dead, felled by an assassin's bullet in Dallas, Texas, as he continued his tour of that southwestern state. And Frank, we now have this. The presidential plane is airborne. It has left Love Field in Dallas, carrying President Lyndon Johnson to Washington. Mr. Johnson was sworn in, we have a correction in the time, less than an hour ago at 3.39 Eastern Standard Time as President of the United States. He was sworn in by a district judge, Sarah Hughes, aboard the presidential plane parked at Love Field, where it had come in earlier this morning to Dallas and deposited then-President Kennedy and his party. At the swearing-in of Lyndon Bain Johnson as President of the United States were Mrs. Kennedy, the late President's widow, and Mrs. Johnson, now the First Lady of the land, several staff members and several congressmen, apparently those who had been in the presidential party for this swing into Texas. Mr. Johnson asked as many White House people as possibly could to crowd into the executive suite of the airplane, Air Force One, to witness the ceremony. Judge Hughes, who administered the oath, is said to have been weeping while she swore Mr. Johnson in as President of the United States. Then the plane took off immediately for Washington with President Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Kennedy, and some White House aides aboard. Again, it is a, a question of reaction, a question of Washington shifting, getting used to a change, in spite of the fact that it came violently and dramatically. One of the changes will take place in the area of foreign policy. How much? Reported now by NBC's State Department correspondent, Ellie Abel, in Washington. All we can be sure about at the moment is the great shock wave felt round the world, not only among friends and allies and neutrals, but also, I suspect, in the communist-ruled countries. The controlled Soviet press has much of the time been sharply and automatically critical of U.S. policy, but the person of John F. Kennedy was treated with respect. Just a week ago, the Soviet people were told that Yale Professor Boghorn, arrested as a spy, was being released because of the president's concern over the case. He had met Soviet Premier Khrushchev in Vienna in 1961, resisted Soviet encroachments on Berlin, played and won that deadly game of nuclear poker with Khrushchev over Cuba. He was also the man who agreed to a limited test ban treaty and persuaded the U.S. Senate to ratify that step. The guess here is that President Lyndon Johnson will carry on much the same policy. He was certainly very much directly involved in that policy. He showed the flag in many distant parts of the world as President Kennedy's personal emissary. But just as the Western allies may hesitate while pledging full support to the new president, the Soviets presumably are not sure at the moment what to expect out of Washington. They have tended to place a certain faith in John Kennedy personally as a man they disagreed with, but a man who wanted peace. 
who was trying to defuse some of the explosive situations around the world, who favored in the long run a policy based on mutual recognition that nuclear war is no rational option for mankind in this day and age. The Russians know less about Lyndon Johnson, and they may well play a waiting game until they have a surer feel of his reactions and attitudes. Ellie Abel, NBC News, reporting. More from Dallas now on what may be, I repeat, may be, the capture of the assassin. Uh, we know this much. One man has been taken into custody. He was taken into custody in the Texas theater in Dallas, uh, specifically for killing a Dallas policeman. We are told this, that a check was made of the building from which the shots that killed President Kennedy were fired, and they found a rifle on the fifth floor of that building. Police then received a tip that a man suspected as the assassin had gone into the Texas theater. Two Dallas policemen went into the theater. They uh, were told by an usher that a man had just come in. They spotted him. One policeman fired at the suspect who returned the fire, killing the first policeman. There was shooting within the theater. The other policeman then arrested the suspect who yelled, it's all over now. He was clapped into handcuffs and taken out. We do not yet know if this is the man who fired the shot that killed President Kennedy. I am told that our station in Fort Worth, Dallas, has more late film. So, for a report, we go to station WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas. Hundreds of persons witnessed the shooting in Dallas just after the noon hour. We have films of eyewitness reports. Coming up is a statement by Charles Brand who was on the sidewalk and saw the shooting. Unfortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the president when it happened. Tell us exactly what you saw, sir. <laughs> he was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Palmer Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved in the... Man, that's all right, sir. You were ahead, Charlie. As he as he was waving back, he was he was the shot rang out and he slumped down in the seat and his wife reached up toward him and as he, as he was slumping down and the second shot went off and it just knocked him down from, from the seat. The two shots, two shots. Did you see the man who did this? No, sir, I did not see the man who did it. I, I all I. All I did was look in the man's face when he was shot there and saw that expression on his face and grabbed himself and slide. And the second one, whenever it went, why, I'm positive it had hit him. I hope it didn't, but I'm positive that it hit him and, it, and he went all the way down in the car. Then they speeded up and I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him in hopes that there wasn't a maniac around here. I'm sorry. I can't help you more, but I, I won't forget. Yes. Polaroid picture taken by another witness, Mary Norman of Dallas, showing the president slumped over in the car. Just as Mary started to take the picture and the president became, came right even with us, two shot, we looked at him and he was looking at a dog in the middle of the seat. Two shots rang out and he grabbed his chest and a look of pain on his face and fell across toward Jackie. And she uh, fell over on him and said, my God, he's shot. And uh, that t uh, there was an interval, and then three or four more shots rang out. But that time, the motorcade had sped away. Uh, what prompted you to take the picture at that particular instant, ma'am? Well, that's the only chance I had. Mine is a Polaroid, and I can only take one every ten seconds. And that was it was at that time whenever Did I took it. Did you know he was shot? No, I didn't. I must have sensed it immediately when he slumped, because in the picture that's the way she's there, and he slumped over. And did, did you see, the, were you a witness, did you see the person who, who uh, fired the... No, weapon? not. I didn't see any person fire the weapon. You only heard it? I only heard it. And I looked up and saw a man running up this hill. Uh, could, could you tell me, uh, uh, you had no idea? No, you I had no idea. I had nothing to go by. I mean, I, I don't think it dawned on me for an instant that the president had been shot. I mean, I knew, and yet it just didn't register. Did you get a look at the, uh, the, the fact? No, I had taken the picture and then the shots, and I, 
I decided it was time to fall on the ground. She did fall on the ground. <laughs> Mary Norman was the woman who put the picture on the right. The other woman was a companion, Jean Hill. Coming up again now are our films of the last minute of President Kennedy's life and the actual shooting scene in Dallas. The presidential motorcade is passing the City Hall in Dallas, also containing the police department, which had pledged extra precautionary measures against possible violence. A big crowd gathered along the sidewalks of Main Street. He passed down Main Street during the height of the noon hour after speaking in Fort Worth, where he had spent the night. The motorcade is moving slowly west, about 20 miles an hour. No estimate of the crowd has ever been made. Past workmen, past office workers, past thousands of young people who had cut classes at school to see the president and his attractive wife. That is the school depository on the right, the building from which the sniper fired. Now these are the last moments of President this is the shooting scene, the confused moments, as the cameraman runs toward the presidential car, leaving his camera running all the while. Past a park. A woman taking shelter on the lawn of a park. Another man holding his son. Another woman crouching in the, then the presidential car hurrying toward Parkland Hospital. Confusion everywhere. A lone picket past the Dallas trademark where the president was to speak. In his address, he was to criticize the fanatical right. This is Parkland Hospital, some two miles from the shooting scene. By now, the presidential car but the dying president has already arrived. The president died 30 minutes after the shooting in the hospital emergency room. This is the emergency room of Parkland Hospital, a public hospital in Dallas, Texas. This is Major General Clifton, the military agent. Late word just in from Dallas, homicide detective Lavelle told WBAP newsman James Kerr in Dallas a few minutes ago, they have little doubt that 24-year-old Lee Oswald of Dallas is the man who shot and killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett shortly after President Kennedy was shot to death this afternoon. Oswald was pulled screaming and shouting from the Texas theater by officers who had gone there on a tip that Oswald was there. He brandished a pistol which officers took away from him after a struggle. Oswald was quoted as saying, it's all over now. A large crowd had congregated around the theater and police had to hold back the crowd because they were of the impression that the man was the president's assassin. Officer Tipper had been killed by a man answering the description of Oswald in the neighborhood a short time before. The coincidence in the case is that Oswald worked as a stockman at the Texas Book Depository, the building from which the sniper shot President Kennedy. Dallas police have declined to say whether they think Oswald is connected with the assassination. This other late word in, a 24-year-old man who said two years ago he wanted Russian citizenship was questioned today to see whether he had any connection with the assassination of President Kennedy. He was identified as Lee Harvey Oswald of Fort Worth. He was pulled screaming and yelling from the Texas theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, shortly after a Dallas policeman was shot to death. As more late film arrive, we will show them instantly, unedited, on the screen. This is Charles Murphy reporting from WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, Dallas. Now, there is just one conflict between
between what Charles Murphy has just reported to you and what we have from the wires coming out of Dallas, uh, the indications are in the last story we had here that uh, the suspect had been taken into custody, Oswald, and uh, the dead Dallas policeman engaged in a, a shooting uh, affray within the Texas theater where the suspect was ultimately taken into custody. Uh, however, Murphy reported that the killing of the policeman took place in the vicinity that uh, Oswald was then chased into the theater and uh, then arrested. Uh, we do not yet know, and as Murphy pointed out, Dallas police have not yet indicated whether they feel there is a connection between this man and the assassination of President Kennedy. But uh, Murphy did report that the man was employed as a stock clerk in the building from which the fatal shots were fired. And there was also the report that two years ago he said he would like to have Russian citizenship. Frank? Bill, we have... Um I think we have some late information from WBAP in Fort Worth, so let's go there and uh, to Charles Murphy. Here is more information about the suspect Oswald. On November 1st, 1959, Oswald told the United States Embassy in Moscow he had applied for Soviet citizenship. He said he had been sent a tour, he had been a tourist rather, in Russia since October 13th of that year. Oswald was reported to have a Russian wife. The Fort Worth Star-Telegram confirmed that the man held in Dallas was the same Oswald and said his mother was being taken to Dallas police headquarters to see him. Oswald put up a wild fight in the theater. Charles Murphy reporting from WBAP-TV, WBA Fort Worth, Dallas. There is this late report on the condition of Texas Governor John Conley. He is uh, said to be in very, very serious but not critical condition. An aide said he suffered three wounds, one in the right arm, one in the right leg, one in the back that pierced his body. And an aide to the governor says the governor had been in surgery an hour, probably would be there for another hour. Frank? Oh, just thinking back, uh, Bill, a little earlier in the, in the day when we allowed ourselves to have some hope, um, when we were told that uh, the fact that the governor had been taken into the emergency room in the hospital there, it, it appeared that he perhaps was in more critical condition than the president. Uh, this was an instant mental reaction, I suppose, had we been uh, inclined to be more pessimistic, we would have realized then that perhaps the president was beyond much medical help. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a new arrival time for um, President Kennedy's body in Washington. It's now estimated that the plane will touch down at Andrews Air Force Base just outside the nation's capital at 6.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today, which is, what, about an hour and a half? About that time. Roughly an hour and a half from now. And that the plane that um, some members of the cabinet and press secretary Salinger were taking to, um, to the Far East has, um, of course, turned around and is headed back to Washington and that it has touched down in Honolulu on its way back to the United States. Bill? Uh, there is little, very little, actually, that we can add to what we have already brought you thus far. We have lost a president. Lyndon Johnson has been sworn in as the new president. He is now flying on Air Force One to Washington, and our information is that uh, he is on the same aircraft that is bringing the president's body, the late president's body, back to, uh, to Washington, D.C. It's expected there at 6.05, as Frank mentioned, Eastern Standard Time, about an hour and a half from now. Also on the plane with President Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, and Mrs. Kennedy, the widow of the late president. Yes, Frank. We mentioned a while ago that this um, federal judge, Sarah Hughes, is that correct, yes, who um, swore in President Johnson that the swearing-in ceremony took place aboard the um, presidential jet. That certainly is the first time that's ever happened in history. Also the first woman to administer. The first woman to ever administer the oath of office. These have occurred under unusual circumstances, I recall, and I'm trusting memory here, that when uh, President Calvin Coolidge was sworn in, he was sworn in by his father in Vermont. Is that correct, Vermont? I think so. I believe his uh, father was living in Vermont at that time. He was quite an elderly man, was a justice of the peace. Coolidge was roused from bed and told about the, um, the death of um, President Harding. And his elderly father, a justice of the peace, swore him in as president of the United States. It seemed to many at that time fitting that the ceremony would be very simple, take place in the parlor of this quite conservative old house in um, rugged New England territory. News of presidents... Kennedy's assassination has mercifully been withheld from his 98-year-old maternal grandmother who lives in Boston. Mrs. John Fitzgerald is her name. She lives with a son, Thomas Fitzgerald, and he says he doesn't think that he will ever tell his mother that her grandson, the President of the United States, is now dead. 
and the 16-year-old daughter of Lyndon Johnson was in class today at the National Cathedral School for Girls in Washington when she heard of the assassination of President Kennedy. An aide to President Johnson said she told the school principal to release her to nobody but to the Secret Service. And the aide, Miss Willie Day Taylor, went to the Johnson home to be there when Lucy, the daughter, arrived. A moment ago, we show you, showed you some film that was made last night in Houston, Texas, when the president arrived there, and we had excerpts of the speech that he made. Uh, we have some more now, um, film made in San Antonio, and uh, if we're ready, somebody indicate to me. President Kennedy flew to Texas, as you know, only yesterday, in what was to be a two-day tour with uh, major speeches in San Antonio and Houston. The president and Mrs. Kennedy... Uh, both in the Air Force jet, arrived at San Antonio's International Airport. And his mission was to dedicate the new Aerospace Medical Health Center at nearby Brooks Air Force Base. This is in San Antonio. And his intention, too, was to spend some of the 48 hours in Texas in old-fashioned politicking. At the San Antonio Airport and later in the motorcade to Brooks, the crowds were large and the welcome was friendly. The president rode in his open car with Texas Governor John Connolly, Jr. In San Antonio, in fact, in all of Texas... Uh, this is the truly space-conscious territory, and so the focus of the president's visit to Brooks Air Force Base was an enthusiastic defense of this nation's space program. With Mrs. Kennedy on the platform, the president helped dedicate the new $6 million aerospace health center, and in just a moment we will hear an excerpt of the remarks that he made. So, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, Governor... Vice President, Senator, members of the Congress, members of the military, ladies and gentlemen. For more than three years, I've spoken about the, the new frontier. This is not a partisan term, and it's not the exclusive property of Republicans or Democrats. It refers instead to this nation's faith in history, to the fact that we do stand on the edge of a great new era, filled with both crisis and opportunity, an era to be characterized by achievement and by challenge. It is an area which calls for action and for the best efforts of all those who would test the unknown and the uncertain in every phase of human endeavor. It is a time for pathfinders and pioneers. I have come to Texas today to salute an outstanding group of pioneers man who manned the Brooks Air Force Base School of Aerospace Medicine and the Aerospace Medical Center. The United States' effort in space was a major issue in the 1960 presidential campaign that resulted in the election of John Fitzgerald Kennedy to the White House. He immediately launched um, an increased program called for greater appropriations, a, an approach that has recently run into increasing criticism particularly at time to consider the appropriation bill. He was in Texas, uh, not only to politic for the 1964 campaign, but also to in part justify the expenditures that had been made and call for an even greater effort in space. So we would like now an examination of President Kennedy as a space age president and his attitude toward the new challenge of the outer dimensions. For this, we would go to our studios in Washington and NBC's Peter Hackness. Well, Frank, as most offices here in Washington, both the Pentagon and NASA, most of the people who are uh, who once knew the president, even on a very casual basis, are speechless at this point. They felt they had a friend and a very genuine booster in Mr. Kennedy, despite the fact that uh, he and they differed from time to time over specific projects. He was, after all, the first president of the so-called space age. He stepped in at a time when... As you recall, we were lagging behind in various areas. He did his very best to uh, fight for what he thought the nation needed in the way of defense and to get along in space. All the way through, he was one who, through our speeches and our developments at the United Nations, including his own speech, decided that the future of outer space was to be peaceful, at least as far as this country was concerned. He was very severely criticized by many for his stand. A number of people in Congress thought it was a, uh, it was sheer folly to stand up at the United Nations and uh, preach peace in space when the Russians were presumably getting uh, so far ahead of us 
There is no proof, of course, that they are ahead of us in these various areas, but it did have its effect, as you saw very recently in Congress, when they pared back the amount of money the president had asked for for our space program and going to the moon. He believed in it. He wanted cooperation uh, to the very best of his ability with whatever safeguards we could pick up along the way. He was a friend, as I said, also of the military. He had visited most of the military, major military installations in this country, as well as our space installations. I remember being with him both at Cape Canaveral and at Houston when he was getting his first real look-see into the uh, Project Mercury and what lies beyond. At one point, he stood aside and was chatting informally with one of the astronauts who was on hand rather conveniently to show him the marvels of the space age. And he remarked aloud that he marveled, first of all, that anyone could get in to that capsule. And uh, we recall some of his joking with John Glenn when the astronaut was here in Washington about some of the things that he had seen from space. And once at the Cape, he was overheard to remark that had uh, things been a little bit different with him, he too might have liked to make a trip into space. So he was a pioneer in that sense. He wanted to do new things. He was constantly reading, and he was most interested in all of the technical aspects of how you get into space, how you get back, and what is the best, the latest and best for the military. Uh, President Johnson presumably will make no major changes, either in the military or space, except that he may be expected to continue to pound hard to keep the United States ahead or to push it ahead in various aspects of space. He has been the head of the President's Space Council. He's been kept informed of all of the technical developments. He is a booster of this effort and is expected to go along in that, uh, in that general uh, trend. Uh, one Pentagon man, when I called over there today, was in, a, uh, I won't say a state of shock, but rather, rather broken up. Uh, he said the death of Mr. Kennedy won't stop anything here. We'll carry on where he left off. The military officers, uh, traditionally, the Army is in charge of state funerals where the military is involved. They are, a number of those people are at the White House at this moment discussing the various possibilities should a military funeral or anything having to do with Arlington be on the agenda. Whether or not they will be involved, there will surely be a funeral cortege of one kind or another through at least part of Washington. Uh, it has been a tradition that the military caissons, the horses, the smartly dressed ceremonial troops take part, and they are ready, I'm told, at this moment, to do whatever they can, whatever they're called upon to do. There was one officer in this general area with whom I spoke, the same age as the president, and as he put it to me, it was like this. It's almost too difficult to think that we'll be doing this sad duty. This is Peter Hackett, NBC News, Washington. What has happened is numbing. There are, I think, few people who can understand it, who can appreciate the fact that Mr. Kennedy is, in fact, dead is a tremendous shock and does know. I think perhaps our ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, has summed it up with this statement. The tragedy of this day is beyond instant rec uh, comprehension. All of us who knew him will bear the grief of his death to the day of ours, and all men everywhere who love peace and justice and freedom will bow their heads. At such a moment, we can only turn to prayer, prayer to comfort our grief, to sustain Mrs. Kennedy and his family, to strengthen President Johnson and to guide us in time to come. May God help us. The words of Ambassador Adlai Stevenson spoken this afternoon at the United Nations. Frank? Uh, as this, um, this chaotic situation uh, continues, more and more pieces of the story begin to fall into place, and some of the reports that we brought you in fragmentary form earlier are being clarified. Uh, it is now apparent that no Secret Service men were injured in the attack on President Kennedy. A top Treasury official said today that uh, Robert A. Wallace, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, under which the Secret Service operates, said the service had received a report that a Dallas policeman had been killed by the fusillade from an assassin. It had been reported from Dallas that a policeman and a Secret Service man had been shot and killed some distance from the scene of the attack on the President. The Assistant Secretary, who had worked for Mr. Kennedy in the Senate, is in charge of Secret Service policy and advises on fiscal matters. Now, just a little... A while before he was assassinated, Mrs. Kennedy turned to her husband and said, 
You can't say Dallas wasn't friendly to you. Mrs. John Connolly, wife of the wounded Texas governor, said that Mrs. Kennedy turned to her husband and made that remark as they rode past cheering crowds in Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy, wearing a stunning pink wool suit and matching pink pillbox hat, had a bunch of yellow roses with her in the open-top limousine. They had been presented to her at the Dallas airport. So the roses remained in the blood-spattered car outside the hospital where her husband was at that time dying. She clutched her husband to her as he slumped forward in the seat of the car. She knelt on the floor over him during the high-speed ride to Parkland Hospital's emergency ward. Mrs. Kennedy helped lift her dying husband onto a stretcher. She was taken inside the hospital and whisked from view. She appeared stunned as she entered the hospital. Physicians attending the president said they did not take time to notice whether she or any members of the White House staff were with the president at the precise moment of his death. Members of the White House party said Mrs. Kennedy's first thought then was to be with her children, Caroline Six and John Jr., who will be three next week and who, at last report, were at the White House in Washington. Mrs. Kennedy was taken to Love Field in Dallas, and there on the plane that carried her to what had been a personal triumph for her in Texas, she joined witnesses as Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn into office as Chief Executive of the United States. The casket of her husband was placed aboard the plane. Mrs. Johnson, the new First Lady, embraced Mrs. Kennedy, and she rode back to the Capitol with a new president. We are going to return you to WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, and Charles Murphy with some film that was made at the hospital where the president died. So to WBAP-TV, Fort Worth, and Charles Murphy. Late films have arrived in our newsroom from Dallas showing the scenes of horror and disbelief outside Parkland Hospital. Newsmen hurry to the emergency room. The president's wife arrives, stunned. This is Mrs. Kennedy in the middle. At this point, no one knows, no one knew rather, whether the president was alive or dead. Mrs. Kennedy conferring with a Dallas policeman who had sped the president to the hospital and in the emergency room goes Mrs. Kennedy. A corsage of roses lies inside the car in which President Kennedy was shot. A stunned Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth tells what he saw from a few cars back. The disbelief registered on every face. These films from outside the emergency room of Parkland Hospital in Dallas as the president is dying inside. Senator Ralph Yarbrough, who saw the shooting, said he heard shots and then saw a secret service man pound his fist against a rear fender of the presidential car in anguish. Two priests arrived to administer last rites. Their names are not yet known. The deed still is not registered with many outside the hospital. Horror begins to sink in. We'll be back with more films from Dallas as soon as they arrive. Charles Murphy, WBAP TV, Fort Worth, Dallas. There is this reaction to the death of President Kennedy from Thank you, President Charles de Gaulle, who said President Kennedy died like a soldier under fire for his duty and in the service of his country. In the name of the French people, ever the friend of the American people, I salute this great example and this great memory. There is also reaction from Canada, our neighbor to the north, and we have that report as recorded in this conversation with our NBC correspondent, Leif Eve, 
in Ottawa. A deeply shaken Prime Minister Lester Pearson announced the news of President Kennedy's death to Canada's House of Commons. An aide who walked to his front bench shortly before the beginning of the afternoon session and handed him a slip of paper. In a voice that was close to the breaking point several times, the Prime Minister told a hushed Commons that the President's death is a tragedy for all of us. No people, he said, will share more deeply in that tragedy than the people of Canada, the neighbors of the United States. He said, our hearts are filled with sadness. The Prime Minister was a longtime personal friend of the late President, dating from the time when Mr. Pearson was Canadian ambassador to Washington and Mr. Kennedy was a senator. The Prime Minister's tribute was followed by those of the other party group and Cummins immediately adjourned until Monday. All Canadian radio and television stations broke schedules to carry uninterrupted news of the President's assassination and to recall his 1961 visit to Canada. Eat NBC News, Ottawa. Not to dwell on maudlin items or to become too morose in this, but the Kennedy children, Caroline and John, as has been mentioned before, were at the White House today when they lost their father in Dallas, Texas. There is a story from Washington that it's believed that the task of telling them what has happened will be left to Mrs. Kennedy. And it's also recalled that uh, earlier this year when she lost a baby, that the task of telling the children was left to the father, the president, who informed Caroline and young John that uh, they had lost their baby brother. The children, to the best of our knowledge, have not yet been told what has happened, and perhaps that is all to the good. Frank? As has uh, no doubt become apparent to you now, uh, all regular NBC programming has been <coughs> canceled. And special NBC news reports will, will be brought to you continuously uh, throughout the evening. Very few people are left alive now who can personally recall the assassination of an American president. That occurred, the last one occurred in 1901 when William McKinley was shot to death. And uh, as we have said many times throughout the afternoon, we're relying entirely on memory for a good many of these things. But I believe he was shot to death in Buffalo, New York, was he not? That's Bill? my recollection. That was in 1901. And it seems that we always think this sort of thing can happen in other countries, but... Um, we don't really expect it to happen in the United States, but the historical record will not uh, really bear us out on that. We have had a number of presidents assassinated in this country, the last being McKinley. They tried to shoot President Franklin Roosevelt in 1933 and then former President Truman again in 1950, and now John F. Kennedy in 1963. So for the latest developments in Washington, let's return to NBC News correspondent Martin Nagronsky in Washington. The leaders of the Congress of the United States have united in bipartisan unity in this tragic moment. Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield of Montana, the man who now occupies the office last held by our new president, Lyndon B. Johnson. His Republican opposite number, Illinois' Senator Everett Dirksen, the Republican minority leader in the Senate, and Oregon's Democratic Wayne Morse speak now. Senator Mansfield was just speaking. Unfortunately, a mechanical failure has cut off the sound from the picture. We'll come back with the statements of Senator Mansfield, the majority leader, the minority leader, Senator Everett Dirksen, and uh, Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon, Democratic Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon later. The man around whom they are now rallying, Senator President Lyndon Baines Johnson, is a very, very close friend, a very, very well-known intimate friend of all of the members of the Senate of the United States. Lyndon Baines Johnson, at the age of 55, takes office as President of the United States with probably a more vast governmental experience that is behind him than any president we have ever had. He has been in the House of Representatives for, I think, four terms. He was elected twice to the Senate of the United States, served as the Senate Majority Leader, where his record was as an extremely able legislative leader, a man who accomplished much in the office. His knowledge, his companionship with the members of the Senate of the United States must certainly serve him in good stead, as they did 
his predecessor, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Additionally, throughout the Kennedy administration, Senator Vice President Johnson, then Vice President Lyndon Johnson, now President Lyndon Johnson, served the President of the United States in many capacities that gave him an intimate knowledge and insight into the duties of the office that he now assumes. He was on the National Security Council and the National Security Council Executive Committee. He served in every possible way, had every possible experience that a man could have knew intimately the workings of our government. He is eminently qualified, certainly, in terms of experience to assume the terrible duties that await him now. And now we're informed that the mechanical obstruction to hearing the words of the Senate uh, leaders has been removed, and we hear now first from Senator Mansfield of Montana, the majority leader, then from the Republican... The passing minority. of John Fitzgerald Kennedy is not only a tragedy for the nation which he so ably represented, but is, I think, also a mark upon the respectability and the responsibility of some of our citizens. This good, this decent, this kindly man, this harassed man who had so much on his shoulders and received from some people so little in the way of support in return, this man has now gone to his reward. And I will miss him as a personal friend. The nation will miss him as a great president. And the world will miss him as a great leader. There are some things that are simply incredible and leave one absolutely speechless. This is one of them. In this dark, tragic hour, all I can say is what I said on the floor of the Senate. This is the time for every American to pray. Pray for the president and pray for the country. So the leaders of the Senate of the United States demonstrate in these words the traditional and the essential unity that goes beyond party in this particular moment of national tragedy. There can be no doubt that the Congress of the United States will unite, unite firmly, will help in every possible way their new president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He is their close friend as his predecessor was. And there can be, there is every certainty that the new president of the United States will receive every possible help that he possibly can that can be afforded to him by the members of the Congress of the United States, regardless of party. The words you have just heard from Mr. Mansfield, the majority leader, from Senator Everett Dirksen, the minority leader, from Wayne Morris of Oregon, all indicate what is truly a feeling that permeates the entire Congress of the United States today and demonstrates the kind of essential unity that exists now in the Congress as it rallies behind the new president. And now back to New York. The black, ugly words are in print. President shot dead, president dead. Common headlines that will appear on every newsstand, probably every newspaper in the world tomorrow morning. But there is the possibility, and it is a possibility only, that the man who perpetrated this action may have been found. Frank? Well, his name is Lee H. Oswald. He has been arrested in connection with the shooting of a Dallas policeman outside a theater uh, where police had been sent on a tip that the man had gone there. Uh, there is reason to believe, according to police, that he is uh, somehow connected with the assassination of President Kennedy. He is being described now as a prime suspect, although the actual words that he is the man who committed the crime has um, not as yet been used. Not a great deal is known about this Oswald. We will get more information as we go on. Uh, we do know that he has been identified by police in Dallas as chairman of an organization known as Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And a police captain, Pat Ganaway, said the suspect was an employee in the building where the rifle used in the assassination was found. Ganaway said the suspect had visited Russia and was married to a Russian. This was not immediately confirmed. Now, according to my understanding, and Bill, you can help me with this, yes, this fine. is the building, a, a depository for books. The 
Texas yes. School Book Repository, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Right? Which is uh, located just across the, um, the parkway Freeway. down which the uh, presidential motorcade was traveling at that time. And uh, is there not an arrow there? The arrow, the yes, window? Frank, should yes. be pointing to the fifth floor window from which uh, it is uh, believed the, the fatal shots were fired. And there they, were photographers who said they saw a rifle being pulled in from mm -hmm. the window. And you can see the people uh, gathered outside the building. And then the rifle itself, I believe we have a picture of it. Yes, there should be one there of the rifle being removed from the building. There it is, variously described as a, a yeah. 303. Well, or perhaps all the experts could recognize it immediately, but it obviously has a telescopic sight yes. on it. And the best we can make out now, the president's motorcade had really traveled perhaps a few yards beyond this point, and that the fatal shots that were fired were fired from behind and struck him in the back of the head, and then incongruously some way another bullet struck him in the front of the neck. One, uh, one reporter, Frank, who was traveling in the motorcade says it's his guess that the assassin had about a 45 degree angle mm -hmm. on the president so that it was not head on or directly from the rear but on the side. So There's I... more on Oswald here. Frank. Please, go ahead. Uh, he came back to Fort Worth, it says here, from Russia last year after having been in the Soviet Union since 1959 where he, uh, he worked in Minsk in a factory, left after he apparently became disillusioned with his life under communist rule. He'd gone to Russia after he got out of the Marine Corps, announced he wanted to stay there, changed his mind, then applied for a passport in 62, saying he wanted to return to the United States with the Russian wife he met and married in the Soviet Union. They have an infant child. It is not made clear here whether or not he brought the wife and child back to this country. Uh, yes, it is. I'm reading as quickly as I can. Passport was issued, and he and his family came to this country. And it was in 1959, after he'd gone to the Soviet Union, that Oswald told American embassy officials there that he had applied for Soviet citizenship, but apparently he never followed through on that. Again, he is only a suspect, but he is identified as a prime suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy. It is uh, reported from Washington that House Speaker McCormick says the President's body will lie in state at the White House tomorrow. Speaker McCormick said he thinks the body will be taken to the Capitol Sunday and remain in the Great Rotunda until about noon Monday. Further plans, as you can well appreciate, are indefinite but it's understood that the actual funeral services will be held in Boston. Uh, traditionally, presidents who die in office have lain in state in the rotunda. Now, we have ready uh, for you uh, a recording of the voice of New York Republican Governor Nelson Rockefeller commenting on the passing of President Kennedy, and we would play that for you now. This is shocking and terrible tragedy for the nation and the world. Mrs. Rockville and I join with all New Yorkers and every American in extending heartfelt sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and the President's family. May God grant strength and guidance to Lyndon Johnson as he assumes his grave responsibilities under these tragic circumstances. The prayers of all of us will be with him. I have proclaimed for the state of New York a 30-day period of mourning, and I have directed that all state offices shall be closed on the day of the president's funeral. The president of the United States is dead. Lyndon Baines Johnson is the new president of the United States. The body of John Fitzgerald Kennedy in a bronze casket is aboard an Air Force jet winging its way back from Dallas, Texas, where he was felled today by shots from a high-powered rifle, which has been recovered from a building where it is believed that the assassin was located. And if first indications or suspicions are correct, the assassin was an employee in the building, Lee Oswald, who seems to have a record of association with left-wing causes, is under arrest, undergoing intensive interrogation in Dallas at this moment. He was arrested near or in a theater in Dallas shortly after the shooting. And during his arrest, a Dallas policeman was shot and killed. The suspect, Lee Oswald, was quoted as saying, at the time of his arrest, it is all over now. Aboard the Air Force plane coming back from Texas with the body of the late president is the new president, Lyndon Johnson. It will arrive in Washington at about five minutes past six Eastern Daylight Time this evening, which is about an hour or an hour and five minutes from now. 
NBC News, as you can appreciate, has mobile units at the Air Force Base, and we will attempt to bring you uh, pictures of that scene as, as it occurs. We have been advised by House Speaker John McCormick that the President's body will lie in state at the White House tomorrow. It is expected that sometime later it will be taken to the rotunda of the Capitol, the giant area underneath the dome which separates the two wings of Congress. Now, former President Eisenhower has been among the world notables to give his reaction to the tragic loss of the American president. We'd like to bring you his statement at this time. I share the sense of shock and dismay that the entire nation must feel at the despicable act that took the life of the nation's president. On the personal side, Mrs. Eisenhower and I share the grief that Mrs. Kennedy must now feel. And we send to her our prayer, prayerful thoughts and sympathetic sentiments at this, in this hour. General, how would you counsel the American people at this time? In the face of such a terrible thing, I'm sure the uh, entire citizenry, the nation, will join as one man in expressing their, not only their grief, but their indignation at this act, and will stand faithfully behind the government. General, could you tell us how you got the word? I was at a meeting uh, for the United Nations, and uh, while there, a member of the meeting was called out and uh, came back and told us the news, although at that time, uh, uh, we did not know the president was dead. We did not know when I got back here at that time that he was dead. But, um, matter of fact, we had a, the last message we had was one rather of hope. And the entire company uh, merely paused for a minute at the request of the chairman and each of us in his own way uh, said a silent prayer for the president. Should there be any concern, sir, over national security at a time like this? No. I think the whole nation now would be uh, almost all of us security agents. Will the nation be all right in a few months ahead? Oh, I'm not going to uh, predict anything of that. I just say this. The American nation is a people of great common sense. And they are not going to be stampeded or bewildered. Thank General, you, Mr. President. How history has uh, have assassinations affected uh, the political course of events? Well, of course, in Lincoln's uh, assassination, you were the uh, presidency went to a man who was a registered Democrat, uh, Mr. Johnson, in uh, Garfield. I doubt that there was any. And, of course, McKinley, that brought in uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Of course, there have been other attempts in late years. Uh, Mr. Truman was at a grave threat toward his, to his life, and Mr. Roosevelt, just before he was inaugurated, you remember, down in, uh, when the Mayor Cermak was killed, was, uh, ran a very grave uh, risk. There, these things have happened, and, and, and it seems inexplicable to me, because Americans are loyal, and it's just this uh, occasional psychopathic sort of uh, uh, accident that occurs, and I, I don't know what we can do about it. Could you say anything, General, about how people will feel abroad from all your experience with the United Nations and others? How will it be taken abroad? Well, I think they will be uh, a bit bewildered. This, um, in the civilized countries of the world, this doesn't happen uh, so often. And uh, you remember in the, the starting of World War I, the... Um, murder of the Archduke Ferdinand, I think his name was. Why, this itself almost, uh, well, is one of the contributory causes to uh, that war. And, uh, but here, I, I just don't know what happens. And it, but we are a nation that where our freedoms are allowed, or are uh, observed in such a way that everybody is uh, uh, ready uh, to, I mean, everybody is, uh, you might say, capable of doing this if he's ready to put his own life on the line. General, how will you spend the rest of today and tomorrow? How do you, how I, do you spend the rest of today and, and tomorrow? Okay. 
I expect I have canceled the dinner date that I had for tonight. Tomorrow, I'm going immediately to my home, and if I'm wanted for any purpose whatsoever, I will, of course, be available. Would you have any advice for the American people at this time? No, as I said, I know the American people will stand solid and they will not be uh, stampeded. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Thank, Thank you. you Good morning. night, uh, fellows. Former President Eisenhower commenting on the passing of President Kennedy, who was killed this afternoon in Dallas, Texas, by an assassin's bullet fired from a high-powered rifle. Frank? Just late word from um, from Dallas that the condition of uh, Texas Governor John Connolly, who was wounded in the assassination uh, of, of President Kennedy, has uh, been described in the most recent uh, medical bulletin as satisfactory. Satisfactory is the condition of Texas Governor John Connolly. NBC's Richard Valeriani has been at uh, the White House in Washington throughout the afternoon and uh, understood that crowds are gathering there. There's a certain feeling of hopelessness that goes with, uh, with these things, but uh, uh, everyone turns to his neighbor and uh, whoever is near him and tries some way to absorb the full uh, impact of the knowledge. And uh, there's not a great deal that can be done. Uh, people around the world are trying to ac accommodate themselves to, um, to what has happened in the United States. Now, as we can see, President Eisenhower uh, a while ago was still wrestling with the, with the enormity of the idea and trying to reconcile it with his basic conviction that uh, Americans are decent people and that they don't do this sort of thing, but it has happened with, with alarming regularity over the years. Um, so let's go to the White House now in Washington and NBC's Richard Valeriani to see what the situation is there. The new president of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, is on his way to Washington from Dallas. He is scheduled to land at Andrews Air Force Base in the presidential jet Air Force One in about an hour from now. The body of the late president, John Kennedy, is also aboard the plane. Members of the cabinet are going out to Andrews to meet the new president. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy is also believed to be aboard the plane. President Johnson, the White House announces, will have a statement to make at the airport on arrival. He will then fly to the White House by helicopter, and after that, his plans are indefinite. The two Kennedy children, Caroline and John Jr., are here at the White House. They have not yet been told of their father's death. They are with a nursemaid, Miss Maud Shaw. Also in the White House is the late president's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, who is making arrangements for the funeral. He is coordinating this with members of the military. Mrs. Shriver, the late president's sister, has flown to Hyannis to be with Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, the president's father. Outside in front of the White House along Pennsylvania Avenue, crowds have been gathering since shortly after confirmation of the president's death. Extra police details have been so assigned to the area. They have roped off one side of the street to keep the crowds back. They are keeping pedestrians moving. The crowd is silent, very grim-faced. We saw one student from Georgetown University crying. There was a girl from the Peace Corps who told one of our reporters, Ed Goff of NBC Washington, that I myself am part of the legacy he, President Kennedy, has left for the world. We are also told that, contrary to reports from Dallas, no Secret Service agent was killed in the gunfire. We are also told that Secret Service agents have been assigned to protect the Speaker of the House, John McCormick, who was next in line after President Johnson. This is Richard Valeriani, NBC News at the White House. Local people flocked to a church in New Ross, Ireland tonight to offer prayers when they heard of the assassination of President Kennedy. The president came to that area of County Wexford in Ireland, the home of his ancestors, in June during his European tour. John V. Kelly, a New Ross auctioneer who met Kennedy at the time, told newsmen the people here are deeply grieved. People heard the news on television and immediately ran to neighbors who did not have sets and told them. So the shockwaves go around the world. The chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is Arkansas Senator Fulbright. I worked very closely with President Kennedy in the implementation of this administration's foreign policy. In Washington, Senator Fulbright has made some comment on the assassination of President Kennedy. We would like to bring you a report on that now. So to Washington and the reaction of Senator John Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The assassination of President Kennedy is a tragedy beyond words for his family, 
for his country, and for the world. It is, a, it is an unspeakable crime. I extend my heartfelt sympathy to his family. They have lost a loved one. I have lost a friend. The American people have lost a president who has led the country with wisdom, with honor, and with dedication. In the face of so sudden a tragedy, we should be thankful we have tested institutions of government which will continue to function in an orderly manner. We are also fortunate that President Johnson is a man of long and broad experience in government. Confronted with this tragic emergency, all Americans should unite behind our new president and demonstrate the strength of our democracy to ourselves and to the world. We do not know yet who informed President Johnson of the passing of President Kennedy, but we are reminded that it was another Texan, House Speaker Sam Rayburn, whose um, duty it became to inform former President Harry Truman of the passing of uh, the late President Roosevelt in Georgia. He had just um, been speaking with Mr. Truman, as a matter of fact, a few moments before, I think, and he called him to his office and told him that he was now the President of the United States. President Johnson is on his way back to Washington, Andrews Air Force Base, should be arriving there, oh, perhaps a little less than an hour from now. Uh, we heard from Washington a few moments ago that he will have some remarks to make at the airport when he arrives. It would, um, let us put it this way, it would surprise us if within the next day or two uh, the president uh, does not make a nationwide address, but we have no information on that. The president's cabinet, or a good portion of it, was on its way to the Far East when word reached them of the uh, assassination of President Kennedy. They immediately turned around en route. The last report we had was that they had touched down at Honolulu on their way back to the United States. Well, the president's cabinet, of course, is his own choice. He chooses or he selects the men that he wants to serve as heads of the various uh, executive departments that are under his domain. Uh, Vice President Kennedy now, of course, can choose his, I mean, Vice pre uh, I'm sorry, President Lyndon Johnson can select his own cabinet members or retain uh, those that were chosen by President Kennedy. This is one of the, of the uh, hundreds of different ways that um, the nation and uh, the capital uh, and the people in the government must adjust themselves to the loss of President Kennedy. To talk with us about that now, here is NBC's Martin Negronsky in Washington with uh, some thoughts about uh, the effect on the cabinet. The chief members of the cabinet of the United States, that is the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of Defense, Mr. McNamara, the Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Hodges, and the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Udall, are all on the plane that Frank has just mentioned that has turned around and is trying to get back now to Washington. It is the custom, it is the tradition when a president dies, that each member of the cabinet submits automatically his resignation. The incoming president then either accepts the resignation or instructs the cabinet officer to remain at his post. Automatically, those resignations, we can assume, will be submitted at this time, and President Johnson will then have to make up his mind whom he wishes to keep and whom he wishes to have go. The members of the cabinet are to meet the president's plane when it arrives at um, Andrews Air Force Base in about an hour from now. They will then accompany President Johnson to the White House. A well-informed White House source is quoted as having said that it is very likely that President Johnson will spend tonight in the White House, that he will not only assume immediately the duties, but also the residence of the President of the United States. The body of John Fitzgerald Kennedy will be carried to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, and tomorrow, as the Speaker of the House, John McCormick, has announced and Mr. McCormick is now next in line to the presidency of the United States, occupies a position that Lyndon Johnson occupied as vice president in terms of succession. Mr. McCormick has said that the body of the president will lie in state tomorrow, of, that is, of John Fitzgerald Kennedy will lie in state tomorrow in the White House, will then lie in state in the rotunda, that is, underneath the Capitol Dome in the capital of the United States on Sunday and until noon on Monday. And at the White House, we're informed that the final burial ceremonies will probably be in Boston, 
not here in Washington, though it apparently is not decided as yet whether the president, whether President Kennedy shall be buried in Arlington National Cemetery or whether he will be buried in Boston in a Kennedy family plot. The members of the family have not yet made that decision. Sergeant Shriver, the head of the Peace Corps and Mr. Kennedy's brother-in-law, is in charge of the funeral preparations, but Mr. Shriver has not indicated as yet what the final plans shall be. The members of the cabinet, of course, must rally around. The new president will fully intend to, will offer all of the advice that they possibly can. This is a government that under John Fitzgerald Kennedy worked very closely together, not in the sense of holding frequent cabinet meetings, they didn't, but everyone else always knew what the other was doing. And Vice President Lyndon Johnson, or President Lyndon Johnson, fortunately, throughout the Kennedy term of office, was included in all of the meetings with the cabinet, participated fully in many of the major decisions, the state decisions, was a contributing member of the National Security Council, the Chief Advisory Council, which dealt with all of the great problems of state and sat at the president's right hand throughout all the moments of crisis, such as the Cuban emergency. He is fully familiar with all of the duties that he's called upon to assume, and of course it will get every kind of help that he possibly can get from the members of the cabinet. It is much too soon to speculate. No one wishes to. No one is in the mood to speculate as to which members of the cabinet President Johnson will keep, which he will ask to go. This is a matter that will be decided much later, I'm sure, when the first shock of this terrible tragedy has worn off and when President Johnson begins to function in his new office. These are the primary developments that have occurred so far here in Washington. It's a question now of waiting the arrival of President Lyndon Johnson who will make a statement to the nation when he arrives at the airport, which will be in approximately 50 minutes or so from now, if all goes according to schedule. We will hear then the reaction of the new president to the terrible tragedy and to the enormous responsibility that has fallen upon his shoulders. He has not been quoted yet as having said anything and apparently will be trying to compose his thoughts as he makes this tragic flight back from Dallas here to the United States, where to the capital of the United States, and from where he will now assume the duties of the presidency, as he has already been sworn in as president of the United States. And that's the story as it has developed so far here in the capital. Now, back to you, Frank, in New York. Not in contradiction to what Martin just told you, but in amplification of what he said, we did have one report that President Johnson said immediately after being sworn in aboard the Air Force plane. All right, let's get this plane back to Washington. NBC News, as you perhaps have realized, has canceled all of its regular programming. None of the programs that you ordinarily see will be brought to you throughout the course of this evening. We will, however, remain on the air and uh, bring you reports, continuing reports on this story as it uh, continues to unfold. We have uh, mobile units and correspondents assigned to the key points in the story. We have a mobile unit at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington where we expect the plane bringing President Johnson and the body of the late President Kennedy back to Washington to arrive shortly. We are being joined, of course, with all of our affiliates and requirements are that uh, periodically in the course of a broadcast day that these affiliates pause or that we pause and allow these affiliates an opportunity to identify themselves. So we shall do that now. We pause for station identification. We have this message from Sir David Ormsby Gore, who is the British ambassador to the United States. He said, this horrible, wicked, and senseless act has deprived not only the American people, but the world of a great and wonderful man. Jack Kennedy, the British ambassador continued, was the best and most loyal friend that one could ever hope to have, and I feel...
We are receiving reaction from around the world, and I believe, if I'm correct, that we have a, um, a voice report from NBC's Wells, Hangen, and Bonn. Is that correct? Can I be advised on that? We do or do not have. Well, I'll, we'll get the word in just a moment, if you'll bear with us here. Frank, we uh, do have it, Bill. I'm sorry. Uh, here is a report from NBC's Bonn correspondent, Wells, Hangen, bringing us the reaction of the West German government. West Germany has ordered alert condition number one for all its armed forces, fearing an aggressive Russian move in the wake of President Kennedy's assassination. Sources here confirm that West Germany's 400,000-man army has been ordered on combat alert, the highest condition short of actual war, following receipt of the news of the president's death. Meanwhile, Chancellor Ludwig Erhard, who's been in office only five weeks, returned here by train from a two-day visit to Paris. He's expected to issue a statement shortly on the president's death. Earhart was due to visit the United States, leaving here Sunday night, but he's now expected to cancel his trip. Former Chancellor Conrad Adenauer, who had criticized Mr. Kennedy's strategy of peace, said today his work will live in history. He has given his life for freedom and peace. Wells Hangen, NBC News, Bonn. Report was from NBC's Wells Hangen in Bonn. He advised us that uh, the West German Air Force has been put on the state of highest alert, the highest alert short of actual warfare. The belief there in West Germany is that the Soviet Union might attempt to make some move at this time when the United States and consequently the Western world has been caught off balance. Report from NBC's Wells Hangen in Bonn. Frank, Go. there is this. We are advised that President Johnson after his return to Washington, which is expected in about 45 minutes, will meet at the White House tonight with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara and with McGeorge Bundy, who had been President Kennedy's top advisor, White House national security aide. And then President Johnson will confer with the bipartisan leadership of, of the Congress that uh, they will be brought in. From the Vatican City, a report that Pope Paul VI prayed tonight for President Kennedy. Uh, Pope received the news just a few moments after the president died. Uh, Pope Paul received the president in audience in Rome uh, June 2nd during the president's trip to there. We now have reaction from the United Kingdom, and for that we go to NBC correspondent Kenneth Bernstein in London. Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas Hume hurrying back to Downing Street from a dinner party 40 miles out in the country. An official announcement says he learned the news with the most profound shock and horror. Later tonight, the Prime Minister and opposition leader Harold Wilson will appear on radio and television with tributes to President Kennedy. Harold Wilson has called John Kennedy a good friend of this country, a great world statesman, and a great fighter for peace. Queen Elizabeth II was immediately informed, and a statement is expected shortly from Buckingham Palace. A small crowd is gathered outside the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square, London. One man from Connecticut said he just wanted to be a little closer to America in this moment of disaster. News flashes have been interrupting the regular programs on British radio and television, and the members of the panel on one radio show declined to go on out of deference to the president. One panelist, Lord Boothby, said, The blow that has fallen tonight is for me the most shattering of all. Kenneth Bernstein, NBC News, London. Not to belabor what has happened today, but perhaps to catch some of you up who may not have heard in as reasonably full detail as we can bring you what has happened today. President Kennedy was assassinated this afternoon by a sniper who hit him with a rifle bullet fired from the sixth floor of a building near a freeway in Dallas, Texas, as the president's motorcade was moving to a trade center where he was to make a speech. Briefly, the president's day as it started in Texas. This morning in Fort Worth, he went to a group of Democrats who couldn't get tickets to see him at a breakfast appearance and apologized that his wife was not along. He said she was organizing herself and it takes longer. Short time later, the president and Mrs. Kennedy went to a breakfast in the Hotel Texas, again in Fort Worth, which was sponsored by the city's Chamber of Commerce. Mrs. Kennedy arrived late and the entire room rose and gave her a standing ovation president then remarked that she takes longer to get prepared in the morning, but that it is worth it. Then, later in the day, the president took off from Fort Worth and made the short flight to Dallas Love Field. There, he and Mrs. Kennedy, Texas Governor John Connolly and Mrs. Connolly got into an automobile, a motorcade formed, and it proceeded down the freeway headed for the Trade Center where the president was to make a speech. 
at approximately 12.30 Dallas time, that would be 1.30 Eastern Standard Time, a bullet hit the president, we believe in the head. He suffered a wound at least in the right temple. And within five minutes, the motorcade had broken up and he was in the emergency room of Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Within 30 minutes of the time the bullet struck him, the president of the United States was dead. That briefly is the chronology of what happened today in Dallas, Texas to the President of the United States. Now, further developments, further movements in this story come from the nation's capital. For those, we go to NBC's Ray Scherer in Washington. I left the Capitol a few minutes ago to come here to the White House. As I left the Capitol, Senate Majority Leader Mansfield and Senate Minority Leader Dirksen were leaving the Capitol to go to Andrews Air Force Base by a limousine to greet President Johnson. Uh, when President Johnson arrives at the airport, he will make a statement, which you will see on NBC television. He will then come to the White House, where he will hold his first meeting as president. He will meet with Secretary of Defense McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, the President's Special Assistant for National Security Affairs. They will brief the President on the world situation. At 8 o'clock tonight, Vice President, er, president Johnson will meet with the leaders of Congress, presumably here in the White House. The funeral arrangements have just been announced inside here by Acting Press Secretary Andrew Hatcher. The president's body, the late president's body, will lie in repose in the East Room tomorrow. At 10 o'clock, the body will be viewed by the family. At 11 o'clock, by Vice President Johnson, the Speaker of the House, and members of the executive branch of the cabinet. At 2 o'clock, by the Supreme Court. At 2.30, by members of the Senate and the House. At 5 o'clock, by members of the diplomatic corps. Ray Scherer, NBC News, at the White House. As we have attempted to sort out our thoughts here, as this afternoon has worn on, it occurs to us that... Um, Perhaps within the last month, certainly within the last 45 days, the actual chief executive or head of government of all of the major Western allies, save France, has been changed. Britain has changed prime ministers with Harold Macmillan retiring because of illness to be replaced by the new prime minister, Sir Alec Douglas Hume. A new government has been formed in Italy. Chancellor Conrad Adenauer is no longer the head of the West German state. He has been replaced by Chancellor Erhard. And now the assassination of the President of the United States being replaced by the Vice President, now the President, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So four of the five major Western allies have undergone a change in their head of government within, as we say, about the last 45, perhaps 30 days, leaving only General Charles de Gaulle of France, who has long since been the last active figure uh, brought over from World War II. The plane with the President Johnson and uh, the late President Kennedy is on its way to Washington, will arrive at Andrews Air Force Base shortly. The new President is expected to make a short statement upon arrival. Lee Oswald, the prime sons suspect in the assassination, is under arrest, being questioned by police in Dallas. We have no late word on the progress of that. We are bringing you, as we are able to get the material prepared, a uh, reaction from some of the world's capitals. And we have a report now from NBC's John Chancellor, who is in Berlin. The news of the president's death swept across Berlin. The telephone exchange reported that it was swamped with calls and some of the equipment wouldn't work. As the news spread, people walked out into the streets on a cold and rainy night asking one another if it was really true. In the restaurants along the Kurfürstendamm, the main street in West Berlin, customers gathered around radio and television sets. Most people watched for a while and then left their meals unfinished and just went home. At least one of the legitimate theaters in West Berlin stopped its performance in the middle, announced the tragic news, and canceled the evening's performance. A dance festival was stopped in a similar way. And a show at the West Berlin Sports Palace was halted by the news. Mayor Willy Brandt of West Berlin asked the people of the city to put candles in their windows tomorrow night in memory of the American president who had so eloquently, and only a few months ago, pledged his affection and allegiance to this city. Mayor Brandt, who is expected to go to the United States for the funeral, said tonight that with the first citizen of the free world, Berlin has lost its best friend. Students from Berlin's Free University tonight will stage a midnight memorial march through the center of West Berlin. They will march on some of the streets traveled by the president when he visited this 
in Circle City in June. The student march will end at the Schoenberg Rathaus, the city hall, where Mr. Kennedy made his famous I am a Berliner speech. Tonight, on a cold and rainy night, other West Berliners mourn him. There have been reports in Berlin that the West Berlin police are on the alert for any demonstrations that might take place near the Berlin Wall. The police refused to confirm this report. So far, there have been no demonstrations of any size uh, around Berlin. We would like to take you back a bit earlier in the day now and uh, pick up something of the chronology and bring you some of the immediate reaction of those persons who were actually eyewitnesses to the tragedy. Uh, the president's motorcade actually had passed, as far as, we're, as, far as we understand, had passed a, a, a thickly populated area where there had been great crowds of people lining the street and had gotten into a, a relatively thinly populated area was moving along at a rather brisk pace along a freeway in Dallas, Texas, heading toward a, a market area where he was scheduled to make a speech. So there were not, in fact, a great many of people at this, um, at this line of the motorcade. So each person there could see quite well what happened. And one of those present was uh, the Dallas man who had his five-year-old son with him, and uh, he was uh, approached by a newsman in Dallas shortly after the shooting and uh, gave a an emotional uh, accounting of what he had seen. Hundreds of persons witnessed the shooting in Dallas just after the noon hour. We have films of eyewitness reports. Coming up is a statement by Charles Brand, who was on the sidewalk and saw the shooting. Unfortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the president when it happened. Tell us exactly what you saw, sir. <laughs> he was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Palmer Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved, and the man... The man... That's all right, sir. You were ahead, sir. As he, as he was waving back, he was... He was the shot rang out, and he slumped down in the seat, and his wife reached up toward him, and he, 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 he was slumping down, and the second shot went off, and it just knocked him down from, from the seat. The two shots? Two shots. Went. Did you see the man who did the... No, sir, I did not see the man who did it. I, I, all, I, all I did was look in the man's face when he was shot there and saw that expression on his face and grab himself and slide. And the second one, whenever it went, why, I'm positive it had hit him. I hope it didn't, but I'm positive that it hit him, and, it's, and he went all the way down in the car. Then they speeded up, and I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him in the hopes that there wasn't a maniac around me. I'm sorry. I can't help you more, but I, I won't forget it. Still, we have a, a few additional details on what uh, took place aboard the Air Force jet as it was still at the airport in Dallas. 
uh, for the swearing in of uh, President Johnson. He, of course, had been sped away from the hospital where President Kennedy had died just moments before. When he left, we did not know where he was going nor the route that he would take to get there. Security officials said later that this was for security reasons. When he arrived at the plane, he was, in fact, President of the United States, but he had not been sworn in, and the judge had been uh, taken to the field to perform this ceremony. However, President Johnson decided to delay the ceremony until Mrs. Kennedy, who was still at the hospital, could arrive back at the plane. When she did arrive, uh, the ceremony was staged in the, in the executive lounge of the airplane, and uh, President Johnson, with his uh, right hand raised and his left hand on a small Bible that had been uh, provided for the ceremony, took the oath of office as President of the United States. Standing on his right was his wife, Lady Bird Johnson, and on his left what can only be described as a stunned and grief-stricken uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Immediately the ceremony was over, uh, Dallas Police Chief J.E. Curry, who had driven with uh, President Johnson to the airport, turned to the First Lady and said, um, the whole nation mourns your husband, but uh, God bless you, little lady, you ought to go back and lie down. Mrs. Kennedy said, no thanks, I'm fine, and stayed where she was for a moment, but a few moments later she did go to another part of the airplane, the compartment containing the body of the President, which was in the casket, and the reports are that she spent most of the return flight there along with the body of her husband. Uh, this is the announced order given from the White House this evening. Uh, the plane is due in in roughly a half hour or so, about 6.05, at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington, carrying President Johnson and the body of President Kennedy. At 10 tomorrow morning, in the East Room of the White House, the President's family will go in to view the body. At 11 o'clock, President Johnson, Speaker of the House McCormick, and members of the executive branch who hold presidential appointments. At 2 tomorrow afternoon, members of the Supreme Court and the federal, federal judiciary will go in to view the body. At 2.30, members of the Senate, the House of Representatives, the governors of the 50 states and of the territories. And at 5 tomorrow afternoon, the body will be viewed by members of the diplomatic corps. There is still no formal word from the White House on when the public will be permitted to view the president's body. Uh, at the executive mansion, they are thinking that the body will lie in state at the Capitol later for that purpose, possibly Sunday or Monday, and uh, still yet to be determined, with the family understandably trying to cope with what happened today, rather than trying to look forward to arrangements for what must be done in the future, there is still no firm word of where final services for the president will take place, nor is there yet any decision uh, on where the president will be buried. There is, of course, the tradition of ceremonies in the Capitol, burial at Arlington for the president. There is also the fact that the president is from Massachusetts, that uh, the family has exceedingly strong ties to and in the state, and it might well be that uh, the president's family will desire that the mass, the requiem mass, be said in Boston, perhaps by Cardinal Cushing, who is an extremely close friend of the Kennedy family, and that the president may uh, go to his final resting place in the Kennedy family plot in Massachusetts. Frank? Just to say, Bill, that um, the family is gathering, so to speak. Uh, the president's younger brother, Ted Kennedy, Senator <coughs> Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts, was, um, as it happened, actually presiding over that body this afternoon when he received word of the assassination of his brother in Dallas. And he left immediately. He was joined by a sister, the wife of uh, Sergeant Shriver, head of the Peace Corps, they flew immediately to uh, Massachusetts to be with the president's mother and father who are there. Uh, the two Kennedy children were at the White House at the time. We still do not know if they have learned of their father's passing. We are was, told, uh, Frank, in reports they have not They have not, told. fine. Uh, there was a suggestion earlier that uh, they would leave that for Mrs. Kennedy. Yes, sir. And um, the president's maternal grandmother, who is 98 years old and lives in, uh, in Massachusetts, has not been informed of the passing of her grandson. We have some reaction now from, uh, from the Soviet Union. Foreign Minister Andrei Gramyko telephoned United States Ambassador Foy D. Kohler at midnight at the embassy residence in Moscow to express his shock and greatest sympathy to the American peoples. Uh, he told the ambassador, official condolences will be conveyed later at the highest level. Well, this obviously was a reference to Soviet Premier Khrushchev. The people of Russia have been told of the passing of President Kennedy. We do not as yet have any formal expression from the Soviet leadership. Pope Paul VI in Rome, who was visited by President Kennedy shortly after his coronation in Italy uh, earlier this year, has uh, made some comment on the passing of the president. 
A report on that now from NBC's correspondent in Rome, Irving R. Levine. Pope Paul VI has just sent this message to the American people. We are profoundly stricken by the tragic and sad news of the assassination of the President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and of the grave wounding of Governor Conlon. We are profoundly saddened by such a shocking crime, by the mourning which strikes through its leader a great and civilized country, by the sorrow which afflicts Mrs. Kennedy, her children, and all her relatives. Pope Paul's message continues, we deplore with all our heart this event. We express the hope that the death of this great statesman will not bring damage to the American people, but will reinforce their moral and civil sense and strengthen their sentiments of nobility and of peace. We pray to God that the sacrifice of John Kennedy will aid the cause promoted by him for the defense of the liberty of peoples and of peace in the world. The Pope's message goes on. He was the first Catholic president of the United States. We remember to have had the honor of his visit and to have found in him great wisdom and high ideals for the welfare of humanity. Tomorrow we will offer a holy mass for the peace of his soul, for the comfort of those who mourn his death, and so that not hatred but love will reign among the human race. That is the message to the American people from Pope Paul VI. A message from Pope Paul VI in Rome, relayed by NBC's Rome correspondent Irving R. Levine. Not only was uh, Mr. Kennedy the first Catholic president of the United States, he was the youngest, and his administration, which did not fill out its four-year term, will perhaps be best remembered by the extremely serious uh, challenge to this country and indeed to the entire Western world, represented by the Soviet installation of guided missiles on the island of Cuba uh, in October of last year. The president's response to that situation uh, won him praise from all the leaders of the Western world. In the field of foreign affairs, it is perhaps true that history will record this as his most significant achievement. In the field of domestic affairs, although it's presumptuous to guess about these matters, it would certainly seem to his contemporaries uh, that his um, being confronted with and the reaction of his administration to the Negro drive for equal rights in this country will perhaps be listed as the major challenge uh, to his administration. We have a reaction also from, do you have uh, hard information, Bill? Uh, if do, please go ahead. I, I literally do not know, Frank. All right, you check it over it is, while I... Uh, okay. Well, I know what it is, but I don't know if it's hard information. It's the last three paragraphs of the speech Mr. Kennedy was to deliver this afternoon in Dallas just before he was shot. Why don't you go ahead and recite them? My dear friends and fellow citizens, I cite these facts and figures to make it clear that America today is stronger than ever before. Our adversaries have not abandoned their ambitions. Our dangers have not diminished. Our vigilance cannot be relaxed. But now we have the military, the scientific, and the economic strength to do whatever must be done for the preservation and promotion of freedom. That strength will never be used in pursuit of aggressive ambitions. It will always be used in pursuit of peace. It will never be used to promote provocations. It will always be used to promote the peaceful settlement of disputes. We in this country, in this generation, are, by destiny rather than choice, the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve in our time, and for all time, the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. For as was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. The last three paragraphs of the speech President Kennedy was on his way to deliver when he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas this afternoon. Frank? Now we would like to remind you again that NBC's regular programs uh, have been canceled for the remainder of this broadcast day. We will, however, remain on the air to bring you all developments as promptly as we receive them in the wake of the assassination of uh, our president. Now we pause for station identification. Just, uh, 
As I started to say a moment ago, we have uh, this reaction from Sir Winston Churchill, the wartime leader of the United Kingdom. He said tonight that the assassination of President Kennedy is a monstrous act which has taken from us a great statesman and a wise and valiant man, a World War II leader who will be 89 years old on the 30th of November, issued a statement from his London residence after listening to television accounts of the president's death. The loss to the United States and to the world is incalculable, Sir Winston declared. Those who came or those who come after Mr. Kennedy must strive the more to achieve the ideals of world peace and human happiness and dignity to which his presidency was dedicated. A spokesman for Sir Winston said he and Lady Churchill sat up past 10 p.m. to keep in touch with developments over television, which is quite a late hour for a gentleman of his age. We also have a reaction from New Jersey's Governor Hughes. I believe this is uh, voice only. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. We would like you to hear now the comments of New Jersey Governor Hughes on the passing of President Kennedy. I share with my countrymen today a shock and grief which defies description. A young and fearless American has died in the service of his country, even as many years ago his body absorbed the wounds of battle in the name of freedom. Now John Kennedy belongs to history and his courageous spirit joins the fellowship of those who never flinched in the doing of right and in the search for justice. May God bless him and his family and the America he loves so deeply. To President Johnson, now assuming the burdens of an office on which rest the hopes of all humanity, go the prayers and dedication of every one of us. Richard J. Hughes, uh, governor of New Jersey and his reaction to the, to the death of President Kennedy. To remind you, the plane bringing President Johnson, who has been sworn into office, back to Washington and transporting also the body of the late President John F. Kennedy is, uh, should be nearing Washington now, as a matter of fact. It is scheduled to arrive at Andrews Air Force Base, which is just outside the nation's capital, at five minutes past six Eastern Standard Time this evening, which is a matter of some 15 or 20 minutes. NBC has a mobile unit there. It is our thought that we will bring you uh, pictures from the scene as the plane comes in to make its landing. We have been advised that uh, President Johnson will have some remarks to make at the airport and that later in the evening he will meet with Democratic leaders of Congress at the White House. Bill? There is uh, some additional background on this suspect who has been picked up in Dallas, Frank. Um, a Dallas police official, Captain Ganaway, said the suspect, Lee Oswald, being questioned both in the shooting of a Dallas policeman who was fatally injured and in the killing of the president. Now, according to a man from the Cuban student directory in New Orleans, this man Oswald was in New Orleans two months ago as the chairman of a pro-Castro fair play for Cuba committee. Oswald and several Cubans were arrested two months ago in New Orleans for passing out allegedly pro-communist literature. Uh, member of the Information Council of the Americas, Edward Butler, said he and Oswald once debated communism. He said that Oswald had renounced U.S. citizenship, went to the Soviet Union to marry a Russian. What we know about this man, aside from this political background, is this, that he was in a gunfight with two Dallas policemen this afternoon, that he allegedly killed one of them, that the other captured him, that at the time he was captured, he said something like, it's all over now. <coughs> Excuse me, it is also said that he was employed in the building from which the bullet that killed President Kennedy was fired. Uh, there was found in the building a rifle, a high-powered rifle with a telescopic sight on it and remnants of some chicken near a fifth-floor window. Uh, people who were in the motorcade saw a rifle being withdrawn from that window and uh, it is uh, the supposition that whoever killed the president uh, staked himself out as a sniper, provided himself with food, and just sat there waiting for the motorcade to pass by. At the time the motorcade came into rifle view of the building, if that is the term, uh, we are told by NBC's Robert McNeil, who was in the motorcade, that it was traveling at about 10 to 15 miles an hour, moving fairly slowly. It was only about 100 yards from the president's car to the building, with a telescopic sight and a high-powered rifle that is very little distance. Frank? I'm just glancing at some of the pictures that we have available to us here or that we are lining up for whatever conceivable use that we might be able to put them to. And we see so many pictures made of, um, of President Kennedy and uh, 
and the First Lady, uh, Mrs. Kennedy, in the early stages of their, their trip in Texas. Of course, they're both young. It's one of the things that made them extremely attractive to a great many Americans and others around the world, and uh, very much alive. And uh, they seem to be enjoying the trip in Texas enormously. Mrs. Kennedy, we are told, this was uh, really her first, uh, what should we say, all-out effort to become a political campaigner. The indications were that uh, their campaign plans for 1964 called for her to play a, a quite a prominent role. She was active in the president's uh, first campaign as much as she could. She was removed from that uh, arena quite early so that she might uh, uh, bring them their, their second child, the boy, John. John and uh, these are, this is a picture now, as a matter of fact, made of them earlier, both in profile. She's smiling, the president looking straight ahead. And um, by all accounts, she was enjoying herself, this uh, first real exposure to, uh, to campaigning. Uh, and, of course, the day resolved itself so tragically for her. But the information that we have is that she conducted herself in uh, absolutely uh, impeccable fashion for, for the circumstances. Uh, that uh, she was, of course, sitting with the president when, uh, when the bullet struck him. Uh, she exclaimed, my God, he's hit. Uh, she dropped to the bottom of the seat. The little, it's a jump car, it has jump seats, has quite an area of foot room, leg room in front. The president's body slumped down there and she... She fell down over him, and she uh, accompanied him to the hospital. She helped uh, take his body from the car and place it on a stretcher, which carried it into the emergency section of the hospital. And a bouquet of yellow roses, which had been presented to her upon her arrival at the airport in Dallas, was still on the back seat of the car, which by this time, of course, bore the blood stains. Uh, that she went in the hospital, and that when she was informed of the president's death, that uh, there was no hysterics, that she that she bore up remarkably well under these staggering circumstances. Her whereabouts at this precise moment, I would suppose she's on the plane with, um, with the president's body returning to Washington. She was present at the uh, swearing in of um, President Lyndon Johnson, along with the, with the new first lady of the United States, Mrs. Lady Bird Johnson. So what had set out to be um, uh, quite a new experience for her and something that she might, uh, might uh, enjoy uh, considerably has turned into to the utmost tragedy. This is a picture of President Kennedy uh, shaking hands uh, with well-wishers on his, on his arrival in Texas. And in the background, if you could make it out with the little black pillbox hat and the hair falling over her right eye and her hand at her waist as a beaming Mrs. Kennedy. I would guess that would be the Air Force Base where they flew in uh, today, uh, mm -hmm. Frank, to uh, Fort Worth. There is this report. Uh, we are going back over material you may have heard before, then again, you may not. But it was said by doctors at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, who were in the emergency room where the president was brought, we never had any hope of saving his life. Uh, it is also reported by uh, a New York Times reporter that the priest who administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to President Kennedy said that the president was already dead when he, the priest, arrived in the hospital. The very Reverend Oscar Huber said he had to draw back a sheet that was covering the president's face so he could begin administering the sacrament of extreme unction. This indicates, I think, again, the intense power of the weapon used. Uh, there is more here now on the man who may have done it, uh, Lee Oswald. One uh, police official, the head of the Dallas Homicide Division, Will Fritz, says that uh, Oswald has not admitted anything yet, but he looks like a good suspect. That is all we have. Uh, there are many circumstantial things that would seem to, to link the man to it, but uh, we do not yet have anything definitive. Frank? I think we might note that um, when the news was first received that the president had been wounded, um, the story is noted that Texas is the seat of uh, some strong sentiment uh, toward the conservative side of the political spectrum. And there was perhaps an assumption on the part of a good many that, uh, that uh, some member of uh, right -wing. some extreme right-wing organization might have um, committed this atrocity. I know that in some sidewalk interviews that were done in New York, this was the immediate assumption on the part of persons there. And now we find that the prime suspect in the case, uh, and he is only that at the moment, uh, has an identity of association with extreme left-wing groups. This is um, Lee Oswald, 24-year-old former Marine, who is being questioned about the 
assassination of the president, as well as the fatal shooting of a Dallas policeman a short time later. So it will be some time before we know about that. And um, we have canceled all of our programs this evening so that we might keep you abreast of the developments as they continue to occur. Uh, it goes without saying that um, everything really is simply in a state of shock, and all we're trying to do now is um, be around and, and uh, see this as it happens and, uh, and take you there, not in any sense of morbid curiosity, but uh, because we know that you would want to witness these, these events. The president's plane is, um, is on its way to Washington, should be arriving there shortly. And there is this about this sort of thing, uh, as, as, uh, as staggering and as cataclysmic as it is, it is, um, it is humbling in its own way. It makes us all realize our own mortality and what humans we are. And it is safe enough to say, certainly it can be said by those who remember the death of, um, of President Roosevelt, uh, that this afternoon, wherever you were and whatever you might have been doing, when you received the word of the death of President Kennedy, that is a moment that will be emblazoned in your memory. And uh, you will never forget it. As, um, as long as you live. I, I, uh, I think you're right, Frank. I can recall only one other occasion uh, in which I underwent a similar experience. It was on a transport ship which had just docked in Saipan Harbor in April of 1945 when I learned that then-President Roosevelt had died. And I, I think I can remember how the harbor smelled and how high the sun was and where the clouds were and everything else. And uh, certainly today will be as indelibly dug into my mind as, as that morning was. It's a, it's a shocking thing, and it's just simply unbelievable. It, it couldn't we, have happened. Perhaps we should remind you again that the people of the Soviet Union have been advised of the passing of, um, or the assassination of President Kennedy. There has been no official reaction beyond um, a telephone conversation between um, Andre Gromyko and the American ambassador to uh, Russia, Foy Kohler. And he expressed his profound shock and regrets and said that the official reaction of the Soviet government would be forthcoming shortly. But all the other major, all the other leaders of the major nations of the world have been heard from. Um, they try as best as anyone can to express their feelings at a time like this. Uh, the, 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 the important part is simply that um, some gesture is made and that they try in, in whatever way they can to let you know their own sense of loss and that they understand uh, um, the the, the, the profound shock on the part of the American people uh, who will realize the loss more keenly than anyone else. George Meany, who is president of the AFL-CIO, has sent a telegram to President Lyndon Johnson pledging him the full support of the nation's biggest labor organization. Meany also sent a telegram of condolences to Mrs. Kennedy. The top official of the AFL-CIO learned of the assassination of President Kennedy while he was driving from Washington or driving to Washington from New York where he had presided at this week's AFL-CIO convention, which was addressed only last week by the late President Kennedy. Bill? There must be, in all of this, some forward motion, uh, even in the initial moments of shock. Even as President Lyndon Johnson, the moment he was sworn in to succeed John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, turned to someone on Air Force One, the presidential plane, and said, I, I think it was all right, let's get this plane to Washington. That may sound brusque, it may sound somewhat cold, but it is indicative that the affairs of the country, the running of the government must go forward, that it is a continuing process. And certainly there are people who, with, with no malice, with no cold-bloodedness, will be sitting in places all over the country and trying to determine exactly what impact this man's death will have on the future of this country, on the future of both political parties, and indeed on the future of the world and on its hopes for, for peace. Uh, they will recall the, the strength with which Mr. Kennedy faced up to the Russian threat in Cuba. Uh, they will wonder if we have other men who have the same strength, more strength, less strength, it's a, it's a shocking thing when, when the prow of the country, as it were, is suddenly removed from the ship and then another takes its place. We at NBC have canceled all of our regular programming for the day so that we may bring you whatever news there is, whatever details there are of this crisis in our government. And uh, we will continue with our coverage in a moment, but right now we pause for station identification.
We are back now, basing our operation here at NBC in New York, bringing you the reports from all over the country, indeed from all over the world, on this momentous day when we have lost a president and had another one installed. Uh, in about four or five minutes, if the plane is on schedule, Air Force One is expected to land at Andrews Air Force Base just outside Washington. On the plane will be the body of President Kennedy, will be President Lyndon Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, President Johnson is expected to have something to say at the airport to the American people. There has been no public quotation from him as yet. Uh, understandably, even as the rest of the nation, Mr. Johnson is trying to assemble his thoughts, trying to accustom himself to what has happened to the country and to him. Uh, he will officially move into the actions of being president later this evening. He will meet at the White House with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, uh, Presidential Advisor McGeorge Bundy, who was so very close to President Kennedy, will also meet with Mr. Johnson. And uh, following that meeting, uh, there will be a meeting with uh, a bipartisan congressional delegation. The leaders from both parties will come to the White House and uh, undoubtedly it's simply a question of saying there may be political differences between us but we are all Americans and we will all work together for what we feel is best for this country. Frank? Just um, to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington and Robert Abernathy of NBC News. We are at Andrews Air Force Base waiting for the plane to, to arrive here. Several thousand people. You're on the speaker. Several thousand people waiting for the president to arrive at Andrews Air Force Base. We are here, members of Congress have arrived. The meetings of both the Senate and the House are here. diplomats, senators, congressmen. This tragedy. Come out here in the dark. And on our guard now, walking up to the tail of the presidential jet. They're from Bowling Air Force Base. They're the regular honor guard that usually dispatches the president as well as welcomes him when he returns to Washington. An army helicopter has just landed. It's making a great deal of noise. special truck that has been moved up to the rear of the presidential jet, a special truck on which the coffin will be brought out. A helicopter is standing by just near the presidential jet to take the coffin away. The men are now struggling with the casket. It appears to be the casket struggling to get it out of the plane. bright, shiny casket is glistening in the lights here at the airport. Casket 
it is a dark brown in color, slightly reddish. It looks as if it's bronze. to jump down to get on the floor. AIDS helped her do it. She was helped also by her brother-in-law, the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy. President Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson are standing just near the door in the rear of the presidential jet, waiting. Mrs. Lyndon Johnson is holding the new president's hand. And the Navy ambulance moves off with the casket. The ambulance is going to the other side of this airport. It is supposed to deliver the casket to the helicopters that are standing by.
head of the Secret Service on the President's right. Secretary McNamara and other officials greeting the new President. As he moves now in the direction of a, an Army helicopter. That was Secretary McNamara, I think, who just leaned over and affectionately kissed Mrs. Johnson. We have heard that Lyndon Johnson, the new president, was going to make a speech here tonight on arrival. The microphones are set up. He appears to be walking toward them now. These microphones are just about four feet back from an encased area for the press. of the leaders of both parties, both houses of Congress, to meet with him at the White House tonight at 7.15. Senator Dirksen said earlier this evening that he thought the plans of Congress would depend on precisely when the funeral is. Many, many members want to go to Boston for the funeral. But he said he did not feel that Congress would adjourn The president is still talking with leaders of the Senate. Mrs. Maureen Mansfield is there with Senator Mansfield, the Democratic Senate leader. Mrs. Mansfield was weeping before, as were many of the women who came out here to the airport. The Office of Protocol tells us that almost every embassy in town called the State Department today to find out the plans so that they could be here uh, when the plane arrived at Andrews Air Force Base. Now President Johnson is moving towards the Army helicopter for the flight to the White House, where he has a meeting scheduled tonight with Secretary McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, other officials. He's shaking hands now with Bill Moyers, one of his aides who was with him during the campaign and who has been with him in most of his activities for the past several years. One of the people who came out here was Senator Aiken, who said 
I'm just beginning to realize what happened. President Johnson needs our help. Chief of Protocol, Andrew Biddle Duke, was out here meeting President Lyndon Johnson. This entire ceremony here has been hastily improvised. Telephone circuits, all plans, put together very quickly. The Secret Service handled all the arrangements of the late president's body and the arrangements for President Lyndon Johnson's arrival. The Air Force Base itself, the Air Force handled all the many other details that were necessary at a time like this. The helicopter bearing new President Lyndon Johnson is about to take off. Now the Army helicopter preparing to take off, the rotors beginning. Take off for the short flight from Andrews at Air Force Base outside Washington to the south lawn of the White House in downtown Washington. Inside the helicopter, you can see aides talking in animated, very concentrated conversation. With new President Lyndon Baines Johnson is his wife Lady Bird, who is always at his side, she has been with him in his long road up the political ladder from the days he started out from Stonewall, Texas. is now disappearing from the field. Press dignitaries are moving away. The plane, the presidential plane, the United States of America, it bears no other insignia but that. There the baggage is being taken off, hastily packed. Now the 55-year-old, Brendan Baines Johnson, this is on his way to the White House, the first time he will enter the White House as president. Thus, the arrival in Washington, the body of the late President John F. Kennedy and President Lyndon B. Johnson. President Johnson walked off the aircraft rather slowly, his wife beside him. He walked up to a cluster of microphones and said, this is a sad time for all people. Speaking of the death of the president, he said, it's a loss that cannot be weighed. He called it a deep personal loss. Then President Johnson said, I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God's. That is all he had to say. Uh, we are told that the president's body, which was removed from the aircraft first and casket placed in the naval ambulance, will be taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital, and that uh, tomorrow uh, the president's body will lie in the east room of the White House. Uh, there are no announced plans for any public viewing of the president's body. There will be none tomorrow. Members of the family, top officials of the government, uh, members of Congress, and uh, members of the diplomatic corps will go to the White House tomorrow at specified times to pay their respects to the late John F. Kennedy. 
Uh, President Johnson is on his way to the White House now. Later this evening, he will meet with Defense Secretary McNamara, with McGeorge Bundy, the presidential advisor, and then with uh, leaders of both parties from the House and the Senate for discussions. Uh, he was met at the airport by uh, members of Congress, and the Mansfield was there, as was Senator Dirksen, the Republican leader in the Senate. Uh, President Johnson looked extremely severe, extremely shaken by what he had gone through, uh, as did his wife, Mrs. Johnson, standing by his side as he spoke his first public words as President of the United States, the 30, 36th President. He had been sworn in only about two and a half to three hours earlier by a federal judge in the executive suite of the aircraft in which he arrived in Andrews Air Force Base, in the executive suite of Air Force One, sworn in with uh, his wife and Mrs. Kennedy and uh, as many White House aides as could be crowded into that suite looking on as uh, Federal Judge Sarah Hughes administered the oath of office to Lyndon Bain Johnson. And so, uh, events which started swiftly, completely unexpectedly and shockingly in, in Dallas, uh, only a matter of about five hours ago, have, uh, have gone virtually full circle. The President and the late President are in a sense, back home, back in the nation's capital. The business of running and governing this nation will go on. Frank? The helicopter is now on its way to the White House. This recent innovation in the <clears throat> United States procedures involving the chief executive is carrying the new president of the United States from Andrews Air Force Base to the White House, where he will now fill out the remainder of uh, John F. Kennedy's term term will expire January 20th, 1964. There is, at uh, a time like this, a thirst for detail, as uh, everyone wants to know, and reasonably so, uh, every facet of every part of the story, uh, while fully cognizant that uh, no amount of detail will satisfy, because the simple, brutal shock of the, uh, of the incident itself is what is um, impelling the attention. And... Um, Coming as it did, uh, and in a remote part of the country, not not in the sense of being so terribly far away, but uh, where the normal uh, facilities that are available to White House staff and crew are um, strained to their utmost, all arrangements, of course, have had to be improvised, and uh, we are not we're not uh, aware of all the details of the incident as yet, uh, nor are we um, fully informed on on what will transpire from this point on. The simple fact is, <clears throat> the President of the United States has been shot and assassinated, and uh, the new President of the United States is Lyndon Baines Johnson. The body has been returned to Washington. The new President is in Washington, is on his way to the White House at this moment. He will meet later in the evening with the Democratic leaders of Congress. We can expect that for the next two or three days, uh, we will be uh, kept abreast of, of what is happening and uh, that within hours um, they will have managed to um, get themselves in position in Washington where the, um, where the transition could be made uh, as smoothly as possible. And former Vice President Richard Nixon is among those who have uh, made some comment on the, on the President's death today. Mr. Nixon said, the assassination of the President is a terrible tragedy for the nation. Mrs. Nixon and I have sent a personal message expressing our deepest sympathy to the members of the family in this hour of sorrow. This is a statement from um, former Vice President Richard Nixon. There's okay. this too, Frank. Uh, it's announced that the United States Navy ships and land stations throughout the world will fire salutes in tribute to President Kennedy every half hour between 8 a.m. and sunset tomorrow. I imagine that would be local time wherever the ships and stations are. Of course, the President was in the Navy during World War II. Flags on all ships and stations will be flown at half-staff for 30 days, the Navy announcement said. It's rather ironic and strange that this man should have endured so much in World War II, should have come so close to losing his life in the famous incident involving his PT boat, then should come home and uh, lose his life in, in Dallas, Texas, in, in a completely unbelievable fashion. The new president of the United States is approaching his residence, the White House. A report from there from NBC's Robert Goralski at the White House.
The first of the helicopters from Andrews Air Force Base has just landed here on the south lawn of the White House. It's about a seven-minute trip from Andrews Air Force Base to the White House. Vice President Johnson, President Johnson, I'm sure that many of us have made that mistake and will repeat it, repeat it many times. President Johnson will shortly emerge from the helicopter to the White House. Immediately after he enters the executive mansion, he will have a meeting with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and other presidential advisors McGeorge Bundy. The president is about to step off the helicopter now. President Lyndon Johnson appearing at the White House for the first time. There is Mrs. Johnson and the president stepping down from the helicopter. Walking across the south lawn of the White House to the south portico, the president is now talking to his special secret service man, previously as the head of the vice presidential detail. Vice President Johnson will meet with Secretary of Defense McNamara and George Bundy almost immediately. That is Secretary of Defense McNamara now talking to Mrs. Johnson. Now they walk under the south portico where they will go into conference at 8 o'clock this evening. About an hour and a half from now, President Johnson will meet with the leadership, Democrats and Republicans of the Congress. It had been reported that uh, Mrs. Kennedy was on Air Force One, the presidential plane that carried President Johnson and the body of former President Kennedy from Dallas to Washington. It's not yet known exactly what Vice President Johnson will do in moving to change the personnel at the White House. Undoubtedly, he will keep many of the personnel who served under Mr. Kennedy. There are many changes that will take place, perhaps in the congressional line of action. But President Johnson, with his broad leadership as the Senate Majority Leader for many years, has had perhaps more experience with the Senate of the United States and the Congress of the United States than any president who has served in quite some time. He is a veteran of Capitol Hill activities. In the East Room of the White House, beginning at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, the body of former President Kennedy will lie in repose. Lie in repose is a term indicating it will be private as opposed to a public lying in state. The other helicopters are now landing at the White House on the South Lawn. They too are arriving from Andrews Air Force Base. President Johnson and Mrs. Johnson have entered the White House this is the first time they will have entered the executive mansion as president and first lady of the United States. There are small crowds uh, outside the White House, extra police detail. Details have been put on in case there should be many people turning out to see the new president arriving here. Cars are, however, blocking Pennsylvania Avenue. They're going very, very slowly. They're attempting to move cars as rapidly as possible. The meeting presumably will get underway immediately. This is the meeting with President Johnson and Secretary of Defense McNamara and McGeorge Bundy. This is Robert Goralski, NBC News, reporting from the White House. Darkness has settled on the eastern part of the United States. John F. Kennedy, who departed the White House Thursday morning as President of the United States, has returned the victim of an assassin in Dallas, Texas. The man suspected of having committed this offense is under arrest. His name is Lee Oswald. He is now being investigated and interrogated by federal and state authorities in Texas. The new president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, has arrived with the First Lady at the White House. He will spend the night there. All of NBC's programs for the remainder of this evening and until further notice have been canceled in order that we might keep you completely and fully and immediately abreast of all the developments in this tragedy. Expressions of regret have been heard from around the world. Uh, they will not suffice. The President of the United States is dead. We have a new president. And uh, NBC's Chet Hutley and David Brinkley have prepared a special 90-minute program which we will bring you immediately following this break for station identification. <laughs>